Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thanks for coming this morning. Um, I want to ask everybody, if you have your telephones on, please turn your phones off. Uh, or put them on vibrate, that's even better. Also, uh, no coffee or water allowed in the uh, auditorium. We'll get started in about uh, three minutes, so make yourself comfortable for what uh, we hope will turn out to be a fantastic uh, conference today. Thank you for coming. If you want to speak from the podium, uh, that's fine. Okay. Okay, guys, just a reminder, mic's off when you're not talking. That's an interesting question. Okay. Morning, everybody. Welcome to National Defense University. Thank you for coming today uh, for what I believe is going to be a very provocative and interesting series of discussions. I want to give special personal and public thanks to Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Karen Hollis, if she is here, and her team for making this event possible, for sponsoring this event. Uh, if sharing of ideas is important, if building networks in the national security community is important, and if trying to ensure that we have synergy in our work and that the, the whole of our collective work exceeds the sum of our individual efforts, then these kinds of events are important. These kinds of events are important, even in times of austerity. So I want to thank uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Hollis and her team for making this possible. And just to reiterate the point, thought is mission critical, even in times of austerity. Our society has made dramatic gains in the past few generations. Literacy, longevity, per capita GDP have skyrocketed. Uh, technologies advanced beyond what most of us can comprehend, most certainly me. Uh, and this is the target year for the Millennium Development Goals. We've made substantial progress towards all those goals, although they have not all been, been reached. We can at least claim that in the last 15 years, extreme poverty has been reduced by 50% from its 1990 base year. That is a dramatic improvement in the human condition. Yet all of this is reversible. All of this is reversible. Last Friday, National Security Advisor Susan Rice assured a Brookings audit uh, audience that the United States faces no existential threat. She asks that we take things into perspective. Now, if the National Security Advisor would grant me the opportunity, I would ask her, Mrs. National Security Advisor, what is your perspective? Is it a monthly perspective? Or is it a quarterly perspective? Or is it the annual employee review cycle perspective? 
or is it the electoral perspective, the electoral cycle perspective? I might ask her, what qualifies as an existential threat? Hello? If every existential threat has to look like that, maybe she's right. But historians might argue, would argue, that many existential threats, though they may look less dramatic, can be equally devastating on a society. And in fact, completely extinguish whole civilizations, sometimes in a very rapid time frame. Great civilizations have risen and declined in the past. Toynbee, in 1961, in his great study of history, wrote of 23 civilizations that had risen and declined. There were civilizations along the Indus River, in the Nile River, great civilizations in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the late 12th century BC, Eastern Mediterranean, after centuries of brilliance, the civilized world of the Bronze Age came to an abrupt and cataclysmic end. Kingdoms fell like dominoes over the course of just a few decades. No more Minoans, no more Mycenaeans, no more Trojans, Hittites, or Babylonians. The thriving economy and culture of the late second millennium BC, which had stretched from Greece to Egypt and Mesopotamia, suddenly ceased to exist, along with writing systems, technology, and monumental architecture. Yet by some conceit, we seem to believe that we're immune from history, that there is no existential threat. And I ask, is there sufficient reason for confidence that our trajectory is inexorably and inevitably from the lower left-hand corner to the upper right-hand corner? I think if we could hear from the 3,000 victims of the 9-11-2001 attacks on the United States, bless every one of them, if we could hear from them today, I wonder if they would agree with the National Security Advisor that today we face no existential threat. I suspect, maybe I'm wrong, but I suspect that there was an imperial security advisor to the Emperor Aronius in 4010 who said that the Roman Empire faced no existential threat. Nobody told the Visigoths and Rome was sacked that year. I suspect that Philip II had an advisor that said that Spain faced no existential threat in 1588 on the eve of the launch of the Great Armada to England. And Spain's armada was destroyed, and Spain's power as a nation declined significantly. Could an existential threat look like that? Or maybe like that? Or maybe like that? Or that? Could those be existential threats, Dr. Rice? If any of you saw the national security strategy that was just published last Friday, it states that we are stronger and better positioned today to seize the opportunities of a still new century and safeguard our interests against the risks in an insecure world. But stronger than what? We're stronger than, but stronger than what? Stronger than whom? Better positioned than what? Than the 2010 national security strategy? Than any other country? Stronger and better positioned than we were in 2001? In their 10-year reflection on the 9-11 Commission report, the authors of that report stated that the struggle against terrorism is far from over. Rather, it has entered a new and dangerous phase. Foreign fighters returning from Syria and now from Iraq pose a grave threat to the U.S. homeland and Western Europe. Cyber readiness lags far behind the threat. Congress has proven resistant to needed reforms. Counterterrorism fatigue and a waning sense of urgency among the public threaten U.S. security. So do we really face no existential threat? Their original report, published in 2004, states that the most important failure prior to 9-11 was a failure of imagination. So one of our purposes today is to try to ensure that we're not again guilty of a failure of imagination. 
And as before the 9-11-2001 attacks, we have sufficient warning. Many of the pieces of the puzzle are known. It's not as though this is coming to us as a surprise. Much has been reported on, but what we do with this information will determine whether or not we're able to meet the, the threats that we face. <clears throat> Today's speakers will examine our assumptions, preconceptions, and paradigms for understanding the emerging and evolving national security environment and try to project forward using trends that are visible today. The first panel will uh, suggest how today's trends may play out in the next decade and what the future could look like. The second panel looks at newly emerging networks and alignments of different illicit organizations, sometimes in collusion with state actors either hostile to the United States or unable to exercise responsible sovereignty within their territory. The third panel will look at some of the new tools and the new domains used by densely networked adversaries, such as financial tools, social media, and the unprecedented amounts of capital, money, available to them. And finally, panel four, not to end on a negative note, panel four will explore some of the ways that we can prepare ourselves not to suffer failures of the imagination and to create the greater resilience that we'll need to meet the national security challenges of the 21st century. The national security strategy rightly identifies a rule-based international order that promotes peace, security, and opportunity as one of our enduring national interests. We will need to be prepared, intelligent, resilient, adaptive, and determined to compete with the strong forces of entropy and disorder in the 21st century. Today's sessions constitute the resumption of work begun by the Center for Complex Operations some years ago, uh, which culminated in the publication of a book, Convergence, Illicit Networks and National Security in the Age of Globalization. This book has been a modest success in helping to shape and contribute to the discourse on national security today. Uh, in fact, we've had to print 10,000 copies of it to meet the demand, and those that are out there that you're welcome to take with you are the remnants, the last. We're not going to do another printing. Just to be honest, I'm so sick of that book. <laughs> but there's another, another, this aligns with another project that we're working on, uh, which is a related effort that scrutinizes 12 country cases where illicit power structures have subverted peace and stabilization processes, uh, all the way from the Tamil tigers of uh, Sri Lanka to the gangs of Port-au-Prince, and the way that the international community has tried to mitigate their subversive effects. This project will, will culminate in another book called Impunity, Confronting Illicit Power in War and Transition. I see my co-editor Michelle Hughes there and our team working on that book. That book will come out this summer. If you are interested in receiving a copy, please just send an email with your mailing address to impunity at ndu.edu. The work that we're beginning today is neither isolated, as you can see, nor is it the beginning nor the end. The presentations that you'll hear will also be published later this year in yet another book called Beyond Convergence. And if you want a copy of that book, write to that email address, and we will send it to you. So the, the rules of the game today are that each panel uh, will go for about 90 minutes. Speakers will go for 15 to 20 minutes each. I'd be grateful if you'd hold any applause or questions till the formal presentations are completed, and then we'll take questions from the floor. We'll also be taking questions from a live streaming audience. Uh, and for those of you listening on the live stream, please email your questions in and let us know where you are. I'd like also to ask people to confine questions to crisp interrogatories, uh, you know, the kind where at the end your voice goes up. Uh, we have a special email address for diatribes and monologues. <laughs> Inevitably, there will be some questions that can't get answered because I'm going to try as hard as I can to keep to the schedule because I, in my experience, what happens between sessions is as important as what happens in the auditorium. So I'll try to keep to the, the schedule. Uh, 
Granted, we're a little bit late, so a little bit of indulgence on that. But if your questions don't get answered, please email to that address, and I will try to get and tell me who you would like to address the question to, and we will try to forward and get an answer to your questions. Uh, panel two will be followed by um, a no-host lunch. Uh, our cafeteria is the finest in Washington, D.C. It's just down the hall. And with the, for those of you who have the endurance and stamina to stick with us all day, and I hope you will stick with us all day, just by way of uh, comparison, I was recently at a large international hotel, and I saw a Chinese business conference taking place where the room was filled at 10 p.m., people still listening uh, and participating. So we're going to go till 5 o'clock, and then uh, we'd like you to join us for a further networking opportunity reception uh, in the South Atrium made possible by our good friends at Deloitte and Touche. Okay, um, shall we start, gentlemen? I'm not going to go into, uh, into uh, recitations of biographies because you have programs. I'd rather give that time to the speakers, uh, but I'll say that Dr. Treverton uh, is the newly appointed uh, chairman of the National Intelligence Council. Uh, he will be followed to the left by uh, Dr. Phil Williams from the Ridgeway Center at University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Gilman from University of California, and Dr. Sebastian Gorka from Marine Corps University. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. You can speak from the podium or from the table. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here even to speak about dystopian futures and get the day off to a nice gloomy start. Uh, but it is an important topic and it comes at a very opportune time for me. Let me start with a quick commercial and then go into several scenarios and then end with a bit of perspective. The commercial is, as you know, the uh, National Intelligence Council has now for 15 years done a global trends series every four years. Did it first in 2000. It was Global Trends 2015. Well, it turns out now it is 2015, so lots of uh, organizations out there have graded our copybook and said, how did we do looking at 2015 and 2000? I think the answer on the whole is pretty well, did pretty well. If I were going to self-critique or critique my predecessors, uh, I would think the, 20, the 2015 volume is uh, a little bit too straight line in projection uh, and uh, perhaps a little bit rosy about globalization. The straight line projection is uh, something I do worry about, and in general, I have come to think over long years that the intelligence community uh, gives too much pride of place to probability. We'd like to know what's likely, what's probable to be sure, but we really care about two things. We care about likelihood and we care about consequence. Uh, so you can count on the next version of global trends, paying a lot of attention to consequential possibilities, even if we don't think they're very likely. That seems to me to be uh, unnecessary in intelligence in general, and particularly uh, important if we're trying to look out to the future. I finished my uh, previous book a couple books ago on intelligence before 9-11. It came out after 9-11, and the closest I came to getting the future right was to end the book with a chapter that started by saying, this is a kind of a fair weather globalization view of the future of intelligence. What might knock that view off? Well, it wasn't rocket science. My two uh, possibilities that might knock it off were a major terrorist attack on the United States <clears throat> and a major global recession, uh, both of which seemed uh, imminently po possible at that juncture. Um, and so those kinds of things are the ones I want to make sure we incorporate more fulsomely in the next edition of Global Trends, which will come out in December 2016. I should say, though, if I got those things right, I got some of the implications exactly wrong. One of my implications of the major terrorist attack on the United States, I got half right, and that was that it would make intelligence very important, but I thought it would make the military much less important because we would treat this mostly as an intelligence and policing matter. Boy, did I get that wrong. In any case, I have <coughs> come to think that this period is uh, the third inflection point or flux point uh, in the last couple of generations. The two previous ones, the fall of the Soviet Union and 9-11, seem to come with 
an owner's manual attached. Uh, the owner's manual may have been misleading in some respects, but it did seem to have an owner's manual attached. With the fall of the Soviet Union, it seemed to, seemed to say, you can go on vacation for a bit. You've worked hard trying to contain communism. Now it's time to say, Phew, and uh, go on to other pursuits. That turned out not to be quite right, but it was the temptation, almost inescapably the temptation. 9-11 seemed to come even with more clear owner's manual, guide to what next, uh, and a lot of that was right. Not all of it was right, but uh, it did at least seem to come with instructions about what to do next. Well, this point is much murkier. It doesn't seem to me to have much shape, certainly not any owner's manual, and therefore efforts like this to try and provide some shape, provide some sense of framework, I think are critically important. Let me start with... Um, That's it. Hmm. This seemed to wipe out some of oh, OK. Uh, this was from Global Trends 2025. Uh, let me start with it. It's the fragmented international order. The question there is, are we already living in this world? It's a world where low economic growth, burden fatigue in the Western countries, weak state capacity, lack of international consensus, all of that means that efforts to send weapons and nuclear proliferation are difficult, resource scarcities, youth bulges in the poor countries, and crises that overwhelm the international, international community's capacity to respond. Uh, the implications, if those are the drivers, then the implications are the ones on the right, I won't go through them, but the uh, chronic instability, especially in much of the greater Middle East and parts of Asia, uh, challenges posed by weak states interested in or capable of WMD, by mobile missiles, precision guided munitions, uh, and therefore the risk of regional conflicts escalating. This is a not exactly a dystopian future, but it is a gloomy future. And the question for me is, is are we already seeing elements of this uh, in the gridlock in the United States, the lack of capacity in Europe, the declining military capacity there, the lack of consensus on lots of issues, uh, and the rise, unpredictably, of things emanating from the stew of instability and conflict in the greater Middle East. Second for me would be a, a focus on the Middle East and North Africa. They're, uh, I think, pretty straightforward. All of the indicators are going in the wrong direction. There's hardly any good news in that region. Uh, the conflicts in Syria and Iraq are going to continue, with the exception of Iran and Turkey. Central governments in the region, and I suppose Israel, central governments in the region will be weak, and the likelihood that external powers are going to come in great measure to fix things is declining, as we've seen. We have a big coalition anti-ISIL, but not a lot of capability in that many, in that numerous country coalition. Uh, same time, the demographic and economic pressures illustrated by Arab Spring continue. Uh, chances of instability are very great. There's not much prospect for any resolution given declining budgets. No prospect for much action. Uh, and it's likely that key Arab Spring countries will slide back, not forward. Chronic instability in the region will deter foreign investment. And imagine what will happen to uh, lost generation of kids who've mostly seen war without economic prospect. All of the drivers of Arab Spring haven't been answered. It's particularly true of declining economic conditions uh, and where regimes were overthrown, mostly they back backslid into either autocracy or chaos. When that model happens, it's a recipe for insurgency. Now we see extremism being exported from the region, not necessarily as in 9-11, in that people come and do things here, but in the sense of an ideological and sectarian stimulus to lone wolves, the ones we've seen in Canada and France and elsewhere. So it's hard to imagine that pattern in the Middle East changing. You see that chronic instability and question, I suppose, for policy mostly is how to try and insulate ourselves 
from the worst effects of what seems like a pretty likely scenario. Let me finish with a uh, work in progress. I am, uh, sorry, I'm not good at this. That was the world we talked about a few minutes ago, some Middle East and some things on the Middle East. Um, oh, this one, let's see, okay. This is a work in progress, let me end here. I, uh, I don't know if I'll have the nerve to do this in global trends, but it strikes me that the key uncertainties, no surprise, about the future international order are uncertainties about the two main players in that international order, the United States and China. Uh, and if I have the nerve, I think I will focus the end of global trends on uh, those uncertainties. And this was just me uh, trying to get into it and play with it a little bit. I imagine a uh, typical global business network fashion, the usual two sets of drivers, two sets of, of continuum, that is, uh, China's from exp expansive in the world, role in the world to inward looking, and ditto for the United States. Uh, I'm sure we can approve those uh, axes, but as starters, I thought it might be interesting and uh, provocative in thinking about not necessarily all dystopian futures, but uh, interesting and dramatic futures that might depart from those straight line projections. Uh, that yields four, the usual four scenarios. I won't talk much about familiar terrain, uh, that sort of back to the future doesn't seem likely. That one seems like it uh, um, is mostly uh, history, the history of U.S.-China relations in the 1980s to 2000, when China was very preoccupied with economics and therefore sought no trouble, no trouble in its region, and no trouble in the United States. Let me not say more about that. The other three, I think, are all interesting. The one that grows out of inward looking on both sides. You can imagine that emanating from bumps in the road in China. I see Dick Sullivan here, so I don't want to get the China specialist on me, but China's bound to have some bumps. The question is how bad the bumps will be and how long they'll last and what they'll mean. But this would be a China that had significant bumps in the road, became internally preoccupied again. Uh, we know it's approaching what are interesting thresholds in per capita income, doesn't prove anything, but $17,000 a year per capita income has turned out to be an interesting separator in lots of other countries. Doesn't mean it'll be for China, but it's been a time of uh, both economic and political change in other countries. Uh, in this scenario, we see the United States uh, continue to be paralyzed by gridlock. Uh, perhaps the long predicted and long awaited budget crisis will really bite. We'll get more of sequestration. It'll affect our capacity in the world. Uh, I'd, I would imagine the scenario would be uh, dash middle class hopes and increasing inequality, focusing more on domestic matters than foreign. And uh, I, for one, have been surprised that we haven't had more political violence at home already, and this scenario seems like a recipe for that. Well, then you can think of the implications of that world. That really would be a multipolar world with no leaders, not much leadership, uh, Will probably lapse into spheres of influence, the sort we see Russia trying to construct around itself. We'd see lots of areas or big chunks of the world as sort of no-go areas that everybody tried to insulate themselves from, a kind of international apartheid, uh, and the lack of international capacity would mean that lots of things didn't get done, humanitarian crises, peacekeeping operations, and lots of other things. Uh, and along the way, reduced defense spending might introduce vulnerabilities that would become another source of, of unpredictability. The, the upper right-hand quadrant with a inward United States and expansive China, that I've called China's number one. It would be premised on China weathering the bumps in the road, continue to be assertive in its neighborhood, and becoming an increasing weight uh, in everything from other regions to international institutions. Notice just a couple weeks ago, they started for the first time a futures market in Shanghai, an indication of much more expansive. And in this one, same United States, paralyzed by gridlock, all the things there. Uh, that, it's interesting to speculate about what that world would look like. It would mean that the shift of power to Asia was really a rush, uh, but it would also mean that China even as number one would be unlikely to play the kind of ring-holding, 
indispensable nation role in coalition building that the United States has. There'd be a lot of unpredictability about how China's neighbors would respond. Would they try and bandwagon? Would they attempt to bandwagon and join China? Or would they try and build a coalition to contain China? Along the way, this would have some unpredictable displacement about the values we think of as Western, but we tend to think of as global. Uh, so there would be much more of a competition in values out there, it seems to me. Uh, and in these circumstances, the U.S. response would, I think, be very unpredictable. Would we uh, sit there and take it, or would we engage in maybe even dangerous or reckless efforts to, uh, to try and remediate the situation? Finally, <coughs> imagine the quadrant in which both China and the United States are outward looking, externally engaged. Um, again, China would have to weather bumps in the road. The United States would have to uh, get beyond gridlock. Hard to see how that happens. Maybe it happens only with a constitutional crisis. Uh, but um, this, is, this scenario would posit both, both a strong China and a strong United States. And that, I think, could, you could imagine that scenario going uh, either way. It, it could, economic accommodation would make for better, could make for good relations. On the other hand, the chances of a kind of Cold War redux. Uh, high, high likelihood of interstate conflict uh, as both the United States and China are engaged in many regions and pushing out. Uh, and again, the threats posed by particularly precision guided munitions and long range weapons. Uh, and the freedom of action of the United States would in any case be constrained by the power of China and how we responded to that set of constraints would be interesting. This seems to me to be a, a a scenario I can imagine going in quite different directions, and it's one that uh, I'll welcome uh, comments and suggestions about as we move forward. Let me conclude just with one bit of perspective. I, I think I probably on balance do agree with Susan Rice that uh, absent the chance of a major pandemic, the United States doesn't face existential threats. Uh, I'm guided in this by a, a conversation I had with a friend and mentor, Harold Brown, soon after 9-11. And I was all excited about 9-11. You know, it seemed like a big deal to me. And I asked Harold, how big a deal is this? And he said, well, on a 0 to 10 scale, if 10 is the worst, the Cuban Missile Crisis was an 8, and this is a 3. I said, oh, that can't, it's got to be at least a 5, doesn't it, Harold? He said, no, 3. And in retrospect, he was right. He was right partly because of actions we and other nations took, but he was right. And so I think it is important as we look out to, uh, to, to keep reminding ourselves that there is some perspective there. And probably our current circumstance, if it's maybe a four, uh, is still not an eight. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here, so thank you, Michael, again for the invitation. I'm delighted to be sitting next to Greg Treverton. Um, I first met Greg in 1973 when he was We were both on, children, right? We were both children. <laughs> he was working on offset costs. Anybody remember what they were? And I was working on the Senate and U.S. troops in Europe. Uh, we both did good books on it back then, but it was a very different world. I have a Welsh accent from Pittsburgh, right? So I'm going to try not to speak too much. <laughs> I have a Welsh accent from Pittsburgh, so I'm going to try not to speak too quickly. Um, but I want to start with a question. What does the United States do when its enemies are better at governance than its friends and allies? And I think if you think about the rise of ISIS, part of the reason was the exclusionary and corrupt nature of the Iraqi regime. And I think ISIS has actually done quite well at governance in Raqqa, at least until we started the air campaign. Uh, never done quite so well. In, in Mosul. But I think it's indicative in some ways that people are looking for an alternative form of governance from corrupt, um, from corrupt and exclusionary states. So here's my vision of the future, right? And here's the other part of it. So the, the, the overview is I want to start talking about some global drivers, then drill down to some regional drivers that are particularly relevant to Central America, and I hesitate to talk about Central America with Doug Farrer in the audience. He knows much more than I do. 
Um, but then really start to look at the kind of dangerous spaces, what I call dangerous and disorderly spaces, particularly in the Northern Triangle. So that's what I'll try to do very quickly. So you're a, you're a mega trends. Um, it's a standard view of these, so it's, it's not very exciting, but I think it's these long-term trends that, that are looked at in the, in, in the NIC uh, forecasting reports. Uh, but I think some of these are very, very disturbing, and I think together, when you think about possible, if you like, negative synergies, where they actually uh, interact in some perverse uh, and destabilizing uh, and intensifying ways. So here's the first one. Globalization we've been talking about for years, increased connectivity, thinking about it as a global space of flows, a number of people have talked about that. A lot of benefits, but also there are winners and losers and a lot of costs. And I think globalization has led to what Harold Trincunas and Ann Kuhn in the book on, on ungoverned spaces called the softening of sovereignty. I came across an even better phrase I thought the other day in, in a piece written by an Australian uh, analyst in 2006 where he talked about the unsovereign state. And I, and I think it's, an, it's, a nice, it's a nice concept. So we're all familiar with the globalization. The second bit is neoliberalism. And I think neoliberalism is profoundly pernicious in its effects. We never talk about it in the, security, in the security context, but if you think about what neoliberalism has done, it has actually justified the withdrawal of the state from many parts of the world. It's justified the withdrawal of the state from having responsibility to its citizens. And I think you see, and one of the reasons you get things like gangs, you get insurgents, uh, you, you get organized crime, is because these have become forms of alternative governance because the state is doing so badly. And I think it's just, as I say, never something we talk about in the security debate, and I would argue it is a really major part of that because it's about the future of the state. And my argument is that what we get in is a crisis of governance, not at the global level, but in the first instance at the national, at the state level. And I'll, I'll explain uh, some of the reasons why. But I think that notion has been quietly uh, apocalyptic uh, about neoliberalism, right? I mean, that's, that's what I basically um, would argue. And this is the consequence of it, this withdrawal of responsibility. And I think you see that in Central America, where the state was never very strong anyway. Uh, they started to get, after the end of the civil wars, you start to get democratization. And the state seemed to be taking some responsibility for its citizens, and that has changed. So interestingly, in Honduras, uh, the beginning of last year, people in prison were being funded by money from the donor community because there was no money from the state. Uh, and I think that gives you a sense of it. Hospitals are being cut back. In a place where the state never really was that strong, we see it withdraw even further. Second, megatrend population growth. Uh, some figures there, Dave, uh, Dave Kilcullen, in a book that's really not just about the future of insurgency, but about the future, full stop, uh, I think emphasizes uh, this. Some obvious things about it, you're gonna get greater demands on resources, you're gonna get youth bulges, uh, increasingly for some, for some dec for a couple of decades, increased illegal migration, and a growing market. For example, if you've got an aging population in the developed world, a young population in the developing world, unless technology changes things, we'll get a growing market for transplants and a growing market in illegal organs. And again, technology might be part of the answer and might have a, an alleviating effect. If you can use 3D printers to, to do kidneys, you don't need to steal them from people. But I think that's some of the interactions, and that might be an offsetting thing. Third megatrend, global climate change. Kurt Campbell's book is very interesting because he did a couple of different scenarios, rather like Greg did. But at the very, whatever the cause, we see in a number of things, extreme weather events and rising sea levels, and that's indisputable. Uh, again, the implications, I think, are very serious. Food, water, environmental refugees, and great opportunities for organized crime. It used to be about the provision of sin, liquor, drugs, sex. O organized crime is increasing, increasingly going to move to the center stage, and I think we'll see it increasingly control food and water supplies. Urbanization, very interesting debate 
in the urbanization literature between the development theorists who say cities are wonderful and the security people who say they're potentially huge, huge problems. And I think it's very interesting that the army is now very interested in possible military contingencies uh, in megacities, uh, which have a great potential uh, for disaster. There is some good news, as I say, on this, uh, but some, some bad news. And peop some people have even talked about a new category as well as interstate wars and civil wars. You're now starting to get civic conflict that is based in cities, and this can take a variety of forms. So again, a lot of management problems. By 2030, some of the projections are about 2 billion people in slums. That's one and a half times the population of China. What does that do to terrorist uh, recruitment, organized crime recruitment, gang recruitment, and so on? And I think cities can be seen as the incubator of all sorts of security problems. And here's why. Fifth, decline of the state. This is something I've dealt with in the Convergence book. Um, and essentially, this is many states, if you look around the world, probably about a fifth of states uh, are effective, legitimate, uh, and have good levels of service provision. The rest do not. Many states are exclusive rather than inclusive. And then I began to think about this for some other work I've been doing, thought about balancing acts, the balancing acts that you need to do if you're going to be a successful state. And it's not that we're dealing with a world of failed states, but we're dealing with a world of states that fail to, do these, that fail to engage in these balancing acts very effectively. So the implication, I think, is that you get in governance moving the central stage as a security problem. And it's some years ago I did a book on, or a monograph for the Army War College on the New Dark Age, where I talked about a state, state of centrism, that we're still so preoccupied uh, with the state, and the term was chosen intentionally to be derogatory. Six megatrend, rise of violent armed groups of various different kinds, and I've been writing about this along with Niels for, and, and Doug for about 20 years or so. Um, seventh, decline of the rule of law. We see in a decline in, if you like, moral standards. This goes back to Durkheim and Parsons, uh, the notion of anime. Uh, we see in the collapse of social norms. We see in lawlessness, we see in Impun cultures of impunity, I love the title for the next book, uh, and, and we see in uh, corruption. And Sarah Shays has done some great work in the last few months on corruption as a security threat. So this is where we go in with the megatrends, right? A world, world of perpetually weak states that are unable to meet their responsibilities and the needs of their citizens. So let me turn to the crisis of governance in the Northern Triangle, right? We, we're so obsessed with the Middle East and other reasons in China, and good reason why, but we ignore something in our own backyard. So I use what I call peace texts, political drivers, economic and so on, environmental and so on. Um, political, what we're talking about in this region is a state that can be described as anemic, anorexic, truncated. The state in Latin America never developed in the same way as in Europe because you, the European state was driven by war, as Charles Tilly has pointed out so effectively. Uh, there the state never developed in the same way. We've seen two environmental factors in, in the Northern Triangle. One, rapid unplanned urbanization, although you haven't got the mega cities of elsewhere, but you still have, you still have these unplanned cities uh, that are chaotic. And it's increasingly become a strategic location for cocaine flows. And, and that's been very important. Economic equality is amongst the highest in the world, along with poverty and unemployment, and great underemployment. When you look at the unemployment figures in the region, they're not that bad. When you take into account underemployment, they shoot through the, through the roof. The culture I've mentioned already, uh, the lawlessness, the violence, this is the most violent part of the world. San Pedro Sula, the most violent city in the world. Technology. It's not, an, it's not a region where we've seen great advances in technology. Probably the most prevalent one is the cell phone. Widely used for extortion, and most of those extortions take place from prison, which tells you about the failure of the, of the state. And then the external factors, the US gang deportations, uh, where back to Central America where there was no place, no way to integrate the gangs, and the incursion of Sinaloa Federation and the Mexican 
and the, uh, and the Zetas organization into the region. So this is what you get. Um, this set of, da of dangerous, this set of dangerous spaces. And I've put the, them up there, space of flows, uh, confrontational spaces. What I mean by that is where the state confronts these violent armed group contested spaces amongst the armed groups themselves. Although I'll give another example between industrialists and campesinos. Um, then the, the alternatively governed spaces. And sometimes we take away those spaces as I'll go on uh, to, to argue. And then concentrated spaces and feral, a feral kaleidoscope in cities, feral, feral sort of parts of cities. The notion, Rick, Rick Norton's notion, the feral city is a very good one, but it doesn't apply to the whole cities. Cities are much more patchworks. So all of these things, I think, um, all, all these spaces are also highly dynamic. I thought this typology would work. When I actually looked at the region, I found the spaces go from one type to another. So the space of flows, right? Basically, Central America, particularly the Northern Triangle, has become the key route for cocaine coming to the United States. So here's where the flows go. This was actually done by some people at um, West Point. And here's where the violence is. Uh, along the drug troops. This is from UNODC. So you see that where the, drug is, the drugs are flowing through Honduras, you're seeing much higher levels of violence. You see it the same there. They, the ones in red are the most violent municipalities. And it's, some of it's on the border with Guatemala, but a lot of it is along this corridor uh, along, the Atlantic, uh, along the Atlantic coast. And again, Doug's done some great work on that and actually done some interviews in some of the, the towns and cities up there. This is very interesting. For Greg, one bit of advice I would give, the NGO community can be a great source of early warning. This is from a piece that I think came out in 2011 uh, or 12. It was done by UNHCR and uh, a local think tank. It basically identified what became a crisis of unaccompanied minors last summer. It identified the points of, ex the points of stress and the points of exclusion. Uh, it, it, it was really very much ahead of its time. It's an early warning document, if ever I've seen one. So let me turn to alternative governance. There was a family called the Lorenzanas in, in, uh, in Guatemala. They had a whole set of businesses. They had a lot of employment that created social capital, a lot of public support. They were drug traffickers. But they were actually what, some, what one of the Guatemalan officials called decent narco-traffickers. And here's why. Rather like Escobar, they engaged in a lot of paternalism. They, they, they were the patriarchs. Um, they were the source of a lot of public goods that the state was not providing. Then we take them down. Thank you, Treasury. Um, and basically, DEA and the, and the Honduran authorities took them down. Here's some of the results. We actually destroyed the only form of governance that existed in that region. Now, was it good? Am I saying this is preferable to the state? No. What I'm saying is where the state is absent, these forms of governance are very important. And we need to temper a narrow law enforcement perspective with the sense of who provides the governance. The head of the clan is still seen as the patriarch. But he was a bad guy. He was a good guy. This guy, Miguel Facuse, is an industrialist. He's into palm oil plantations. He gets prizes. He was also one of the shadow figures behind the 2009 coup. He's involved in three different land disputes I looked at in the region. In all of them, is he and his guards use violence and intimidation. In the lower Aguan Valley, over 100 campesinos have been killed. And it was so bad that the World Bank, which had promised him 30 million, uh, an investment of 30 million, uh, or a loan, uh, actually withdrew the second part of it. And the Ger German and French partners also withdrew uh, money because of his activities. And oh, by the way, he's a according to the previous one of the earlier ambassadors in WikiLeaks, he's a drug trafficker too. Uh, but he's a good guy. So some final thoughts. One is where I started. 
Uh, should we be thinking much more about conditions and not just uh, governance? There's a focus on states blind us to their, fail, to their failure, not failed states, but their failure to provide governance. And should we prevent or encourage and nudge alternative governance, recognizing it's often predatory, but can we nudge it in directions that make it more paternalistic? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, Dr. Gilman. I'm, I'm going to pick up uh, directly from where <coughs> Dr. Williams left off. And I want to start, as Dr. Williams did, with a provocation, which is to say that um, I believe that the greatest existential, long-term existential threats facing the U.S. and indeed the world don't emanate from states. Um, Dr. Treverton said he doesn't think we face very many of these, but I do think that he mentioned pandemics. We can talk about others. Um, financial contagions may not be existential, but they can be catastrophic, as we've seen. Um, resource depletion is obviously another long-term uh, challenge that we face. Climate change is another. And what these four things have in common, and we could enumerate further long-term existential challenges to uh, modern civilization, what, they, what the four things have in common is they don't, these challenges don't come from states, but they require states in order to address them. And I would argue that over the last uh, 50, 60 years, the national intelligence establishment has largely ignored these kinds of threats and focused primarily on threats that emanate from states. Um, and this is part of the legacy of the Cold War that I think it's really important that we begin uh, and we continue to work to overcome. And I think the reason why we have this challenge of seeing in a state-centric manner um, really comes from two significant kind of historical wellsprings that are actually separate, but explain why there has been basically a, both a bipartisan consensus around this um, and a consensus within the national security establishment around seeing states as the primary focus of threat. So one line of, uh, one line of state centrism comes from Orwell, um, and it passes down through Kissinger and lots of other folks like that, and that is to see the totalitarian state as the kind of main wellspring of threats to liberty with liberty being held as the central cardinal political virtue that needed to be defended. Um, Hitler, Stalin, uh, to begin with, down through Mao, and latterly Saddam Hussein, these were the threats uh, against which all others were measured. Uh, and in each case, the, the state was uh, framed as a threat, um, as, uh, as Ronald Reagan put it, the problem, not the solution. There's a second lineage uh, to casting the state as a threat, which comes from a very different political place, um, but explains why there's this bipartisan consensus, and that is also the human rights movement. Now, the human rights movement um, began in the 1940s uh, with a focus both on social and economic rights and on, political, uh, and on political rights. But by the time it really began to take off as a movement that was embraced by governments uh, in the 1970s and 80s, the social and economic rights end of it basically dropped away, and the focus became really on um, political rights and ensuring political rights. And in that framing, the state became seen as primarily a threat, again, to individual human liberties. So Human Rights Watch, Helsinki, uh, the Hel Helsinki Watch, and so on, all focused on the kinds of bad things that states do instead of calling on states to support uh, the production of economic and social rights. So together, these created a kind of a consensus epistemology about the real nature of the threat that faces us, and that is to focus on, this, on the state as a source of threat rather than as a source of reconstruction. And I think this has blinded us to the kinds of things that we've already been talking about today, and I'd like to talk a little bit further about some of those things um, under the rubric of what I call the twin insurgency. Um, so I just spoke a little bit uh, ill of George Orwell, but I think that I'd like to quote Orwell positively here. Orwell says that, um, to see what's in front of one's nose requires a constant effort. I think the kinds of things that Dr. Williams has talked about and that I'm about to talk about are things that are, in fact, right in front of our nose, but that we have a hard time keeping our focus on because of the state centrism that most of us bring to the job that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So what is this twin insurgency? Well, I would argue that there are two insurgencies that are going on today, one from above and one from below. From below comes a series of interconnected criminal insurgencies in which the disenfranchised of the world resist, co-opt, and route around states as they seek ways to empower themselves and enrich themselves in the shadows of the global economy. So I'm thinking here of drug cartels, human traffickers, computer hackers, counterfeiters, arms dealers, 
and others who exploit the loopholes, exceptions, and failures of governance institutions to build global commercial empires. These empires then deploy the resources that they acquire in these manners to further corrupt, co-opt, and challenge incumbent political actors in inside the state. So that's, that's the insurgency from below, the criminal insurgency from below. Just as important, however, is an insurgency that's coming from above that shares, I will argue today, many important structural common features. This is what I call the plutocratic insurgencies, in which globalized elites seek to disengage themselves from traditional national obligations and responsibilities. Uh, this goes from libertarian activists to tax haven lawyers to currency speculators to mineral extraction magnates. This new class of the global super rich and their hired help are waging a broad-based campaign um, to uh, compromise the functions of the state so that they can further enrich themselves. Now what these two insurgencies have in common is that they're not at all like the insurgencies that we experienced during the 20th century. Classic 20th century insurgents sought to take over the state apparatus in order to implement social reforms. By, by contrast, both criminal and plutocratic insurgents do not seek to take over the state. They don't want to destroy the state either. What they would rather do is have, is have a, a zone of autonomy for themselves and be able to exist parasitically in relationship to the state. They want to carve out uh, de facto temporary autonomous zones for themselves that limit the state's ability to control them uh, and constrain their freedom of economic action. Now I'm going to bypass quickly the historical background for these two things, but uh, the short version of it is that many of these trends really began during the 1970s with this reconstruction of the global economy in the wake of the Bretton Woods Accords falling apart, and the Bre Bretton Woods uh, institutions being remade and the dollar floating and so on. This is the neoliberalism um, and the rise of neoliberalism that uh, Dr. Williams was talking about a moment ago. Um, but just as important as the structural transformation of the economy has been the ideological retreat of the state. This took place both in the East with the fall of communism and in the West with the rise of Thatcherism and Reaganism. Um, it also took, it took place in the, North, the global North as well as the global South where neoliberalism worked to hollow out the institutions of the state. Um, what all of this has done is it's dramatically increased the precariousness of people who are trying to lead middle class lives, the kind of people who, as Bill Clinton used to describe it, try to follow the rules to get ahead. So let me talk a little bit more about each of these two insurgencies. And I'll start with uh, the uh, plutocratic insurgencies. During the 1990s, um, a new global class of globetrotting economic elites began to emerge, enriched by the opportunity created by economic platforms of globalization. Um, globalizing industrial firms, deregulated financial institutions, and new technology platforms all enabled people to make money uh, in ways that were uh, really unprecedented. This new class of uh, global plutocrats is an order of magnitude or two richer than the kinds of plutocrats that existed in the past. And just as importantly, the way that they make their money is very different. Plutocrats in the past were very much rooted in local national contexts. Rockefeller made his money mostly in the United States. By contrast, the kinds of money that's being made today, the two great sort of prototypical fortunes of the current era are, on the one hand, financial services, which as we all know are very disconnected from global national context, and on the other hand, technology platforms, which are somewhat more rooted in local, in local uh, constituencies, but don't rely on large uh, consumer classes of, of the middle class in order to make their money. Um, Neither one of these require uh, a particular loyalty to a national state in order to be successful economically. Now, plutocrats themselves aren't necessarily engaged in an insurgency, of course. People can make money and they can continue to be loyal to the states uh, that they belong to, and that happens in many, many cases. But there are a, quite a large and growing number of people who no longer have that kind of loyalties. Um, the hallmark of the plutocratic insurgency, as opposed to merely plutocracy, is when plutocrats begin to make war on the state. Uh, practically speaking, the way this works is they engage in a systematic effort to lower taxes, which then necessitates willy-nilly the cutting of spending on public goods. Um, they also try to cut uh, regulations that restrict corporate action and protect workers. Uh, they defund or privatize public institutions such as schools, healthcare, infrastructure, and social spaces. The political strategy associated with uh, the plutocratic insurgency is to use austerity in the face of economic shocks to rewrite social contracts on the basis of much narrower sets of mutual social obligations. And the ultimate effect of that is to decollectivize social risks. Um, Margaret Thatcher famously wrote, there's no such, or said, there's no such thing as society. 
Um, and the reason why she said that, of course, is if there's no such thing as society, then there's no such thing as the social, there's no such thing as a need for social services, uh, along with any uh, responsibility on the part of the rich to contribute to the social services. Plutocratic insurgents prefer to buy for themselves the sorts of goods that the social modernist state once provided on a collective basis. They live in gated communities, they travel via personal jets and private bus fleets, send their uh, children to exclusive schools. And what happens is, therefore, is that there's a progressive moral disinvestment and civic disengagement from the quality of these traditional public services. This becomes particularly pernicious in societies where this habit of opting out of, social, of collectively provided social goods begins to trickle down from the very rich into the upper middle classes and down into the middle classes. And then you have a collapse of the entire social basis of collective goods. So that's the plutocratic insurgency. In parallel, there is the concept of a criminal insurgency. Um, now, from Latin America to Africa to the Eastern Bloc, from 19, during the 1980s and 1990s, structural adjustment programs uh, and other kinds of shock therapies led to the progressive hollowing out of the state. What do we mean by the hollowing out of the state? Well, the physical buildings and institutions of a, adjusted states are still there, but the ambitions and capacities of those institutions has progressively shriveled. Um, State-owned enterprises get shut down or privatized. Wages and employment usually get slashed. Um, and the state sheds its capacity to deliver a decent life to its citizens, leading to the collapse of popular expectations that the state should serve as a guarantor of these kinds of, uh, of, these kinds of social qualities. At the same time as this was happening, as the state was shrinking, of course, globalization was opening up these economies to cross-border financial and trade flows. And this combination of a declining state sector and increasing openness to the outside world has created lots of opportunities for enterprising individuals to make money in all sorts of new ways. That, of course, was entirely the point of globalization, is it made an opportunity for people to make money in the context of a, of a shrinking state. Neoliberalism and globalization go together uh, hand in glove in that particular sense. The problem is that globalization turned out to have this bug. Um, and that is that, you know, while Thomas Friedman was writing books uh, celebrating that the world is flat um, and so on, uh, out of sight of that kind of mainstream licit globalization, a different kind of globalization that I refer to as deviant globalization was emerging. Uh, and this was the creation of global spanning enterprises to trade in narcotics, immigration, illegal immigration, wildlife harvesting, um, antiquity smuggling. These are all multi-multi-billion uh, dollar businesses. Um, narcotics, as we know, is probably the most globalized industry in the world, other than perhaps the oil industry. Uh, it's probably also a 300, or 300 to 500 billion dollar a year industry. Illegal immigration is probably a 30 to 50 billion dollar a year industry. Wildlife harvesting is a 10 billion dollar a year industry. Antiquities smuggling and art theft of other sorts is another 10 billion dollar a year industry. Um, so while the plutocrats were sewing up uh, the licit opportunities afforded by the integration of the global economy, uh, they mostly avoided dealing with goods and services that were banned for moral or prudential reasons. And this left an opportunity for these kinds of deviant or illicit entrepreneurs to move in and exploit the uh, regulatory and uh, moral differences across different sovereign spaces uh, as those became arbitrage opportunities basically for the illicit entrepreneurs to be able to make money. So if we look at Mexico, for example, the rise of Carlos Slim as a, as a plutocrat goes hand in hand with the rise of the Zetas. These are not unrelated phenomena. They are, they are uh, both manifestations of a single underlying set of trends of the sort that uh, Dr. Williams was just talking about. Now, again, Illegal, uh, illegal, in the same way that the rise of plutocrats doesn't create a plutocratic insurgency until a certain set of other political conditions apply, the rise of global criminal empires doesn't become a criminal insurgency until another set of uh, uh, contingencies begin to apply. And basically, what happens when the deviant entrepreneurs, the illicit entrepreneurs, begin to become politically self-conscious, that's when we begin to see the rise of a criminal insurgency. So we see this already in places like the... Uh, first command of the, cap of the capital in Brazil, or the Andragueta in Italy, um, or the Zetas in Mexico. All of these have paternalistic aspects to their operations, which they engage in in order to be able to uh, 
basically backfill the vacating space of the state, of the hollowing out state, and also provide themselves with a certain amount of legitimacy and pride of place within the communities in which they operate. <clears throat> now, let me just finish up quickly by talking about a few things that these uh, two twin insurgencies have in common. First of all, they have a, a series of shared source, uh, uh, underlying sources. The ideological collapse uh, and physical collapse of, uh, of states in much of the world, um, bureaucratic sclerosis, um, and, uh, and then furthermore, the fact that as people are pushed into one, aspect, one end or another of the twin insurgency, they then attack the sources of the state, and this creates a vicious cycle which further undermines the state. The second thing that the twin insurgency has in common is their goals. They're not trying to destroy the state. They're not trying to take over the state. In this sense, I would argue that ISIS is actually a bit of an anachronism. It's a very 20th century kind of operation. It's trying to build a, build a state and provide social services and legitimate itself this way. It happens to have a, a sort of retrograde ideology, and a, and a, uh, but the, the, the nature of the ambitions would have been entirely, uh, uh, entirely intelligible to, to Lenin, for example. That's not what the twin insurgents want. What they want to do is create these zones of autonomy for them, themselves to be able to engage in profit-motivated uh, activities. They want to avoid the tax and regulatory authority of the state, and they want to engage in the private provisioning of, of, uh, of goods that used to be considered classic public goods. And the third area in which they have in common is the kind of geographic and spatial manifestation of, of, their, uh, of, of both insurgencies. So uh, Dr. Williams talked about uh, softened sovereignty, but I think that uh, uh, another phrase that he used is just as, is, is also very, uh, is very relevant, which is this sort of kaleidoscopic micro-sovereignties, where you see individual, sometimes down to a block-by-block -block level in places like Karachi, where different gangs or different plutocrats control different sectors, and the state itself is not providing any, uh, any significant level of control over the entire urban fabric. Let me close by, uh, with one final thought. I'm not sure that this is a stable, that the twin insurgency leads to a stable equilibrium. We understand what uh, insurgents who want to take over states do. They eventually want to set up new kinds of states that eventually you can have uh, negotiated uh, arrangements with. As we all remember from the end of the Cold War, there was this moment of euphoria, the sense that we could check out, but there was also a sense of how do we actually deal with the kinds of threats that are, are, are emerging now in the post-Cold War world. We, uh, we, understood that we understood there was a comfort in dealing with the adversary in Moscow because they were a state like us and there were a lot of parallels between the way they operated and the way we operated. We now know that in the post-Cold War world, the kinds of ways we need to operate to become a network, to fight a network, to use John Arquilla's famous phrase, are ones that are very hard for us as, a bureaucratic, uh, as bureaucratic organizations uh, to, uh, and, and, and as a state to deal with. Um, so. Uh, what I worry about and what Dr. Williams uh, has uh, taught me uh, to worry about over the years we've, uh, I've been reading his work is that at the end of the day, it's not clear that the state-centric mode is necessarily going to prevail. For much of the late 20th century, there was a, a narrative, a myth you might say, um, within the United States that uh, modernization was going to produce states that were a lot like the United States all over the world. There was a telos that said that we were essentially the future, we, our state, and our way of doing governance was the future, and that, states that, and that locations that didn't have this could adopt our way of doing things and would adopt our way of doing things inevitably because it was such an obviously better way of organizing society, and that there was going to be this natural progression until eventually we had little uh, mini United States, or perhaps we were worried many little Soviet unions, but at least those would have been states. Um, uh, that would be created all over the world. But what we've seen since the end of the uh, Cold War, and really it began, as I said, during the 1970s and 80s with the structural adjustment programs, is the progressive deconstruction of states. And so I'd like to close with a final thought. We've been very comfortable thinking for many years that we're the future in places like uh, Africa or Central America or Latin America or parts of South Asia are the past, and that we represent their future. But is it possible instead that they represent ours? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gilman. And to you, Dr. Gorka.
conventional. Less than 20% of all wars in the last two centuries were state-on-state, -state, uniformed, regularized armed forces fighting uniformed, regularized armed forces. The vast majority, more than 360, the blue and yellow areas, were where non-state actors were being faced down by government forces, so us fighting the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, or the yellow box, non-state actors fighting each other, such as inter-tribal warfare. So if you're a betting person, if 80% of all war has been irregular, what would you expect in the next 20 years? In fact, when we use the labels irregular and conventional, we should, in fact, swap them because it is the irregular that is the conventional. Now, don't wait for the five-sided playpen to change the labels. That'll be a long, long wait. But we just have to look at the empirical data available to understand the context of war and what it may look like in the future. So I'm just going to spend the next uh, few minutes just throwing out some intellectual hand grenades, and uh, hopefully some people will be wounded, and then we'll have some uh, Q&A uh, with regards to the consequences. So uh, this is uh, our, one of our product, products that came out of this uh, project for Fort Bragg, and it's an analysis of the use of irregular warfare by non-state actors and state actors. Please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying conventional warfare is out of the question. Don't get rid of your main battle tanks and your aircraft carriers just yet, because things like North Korea still remain. However, you can see in the last year, nation states doing what? Using unconventional war already. What are the little green men in the Ukraine, if not unconventional warriors, in utter contravention of the Hague and Geneva Conventions, without even rank tabs or unit insignia? It demonstrates that we have nation states that are well-versed in unconventional warfare that are already using it, be it Russia in the Ukraine, or China in the cyber domain, or even recently North Korea in the cyber domain. So what are our conclusions after reviewing the trends in irregular warfare as used by nation states and non-state actors? Well, to begin with, irregular warfare must be understood as a strategic function of the nation not something that the cool people in Fort Bragg or Virginia Beach do, or Coronado. Irregular warfare is not just a tactical tool. It was invented to be a strategic asset to be applied strategically. Second, irregular warfare must be understood as a hugely broad, comprehensive set of options from the non-kinetic, such as information operations, to the highly kinetic, such as direct action and surgical strike, and it must be understood as so across the interagency. Every department will be touched and should be touched by the concept of irregular warfare or unconventional warfare. Thirdly, and this is for uh, Joe Collins and uh, the other members of the warlord loop out there. We have to get beyond our Clausewitzian understanding of warfare. Don't get me wrong. Old Carl is great if you're fighting somebody else's army. If you're state on state, then yes, the Trinity has some bearing. But the Trinity must be radically, radically rethought when you are facing groups like ISIS. We do not have the raison d'etat in the way that we had with the French forces of Napoleon uh, reflected in the fighting forces of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. War is not solely understood as functional by many of our adversaries. It has as much to do with identity as functions of a community. For anybody who really is a Clausewitzian but wants to have their mind blown, read chapter one of John Kagan's The History of Warfare. The first sentence is an utter repudiation of Clausewitz, and then he goes on for 60 pages to back it up. Pretty good, pretty good stuff. And lastly, uh, we have to admit to ourselves, in the last 13, 14 years, the United States has become peerless in the application of kinetic force. 
Uh, right now, I mean, if we have the GPS coordinates of an HVT, we can probably kill that person in 24 hours with sec def or presidential sign-off. However, and I say this to the Green Berets in Bragg that I lecture to as well, we have to understand that in the kinds of wars we are fighting now, the ultimate victory will not be brought kinetically. Counting body bags as a metric of success was just as stupid back during the Vietnam War as it is today. This is mostly a war against ideologically motivated threat groups, be it Boko Haram, ISIS, Al Nusra Front, or even North Korea, and those wars are won ultimately in the ideological domain. So what is the future of the threat environment? Here's the big take home for, for Babylon, for inside the Beltway. Washington still does not understand irregular warfare. Not its prevalence, statistically, nor how it is to be waged. This isn't a partisan issue. This is just as much a Republican as it is a Democrat issue. The people in suits that have the power over our operators treat them as the easy button. There's a crisis, call brag. That is not how irregular warfare is to be understood. Second, the locus of irregular warfare should be the National Security Council. That is where it should be driven at the strategic level. However, for many reasons we can go in, into, the National Security Council is utterly dysfunctional and not fit for purpose. If you look at the average age of the senior directors and what experience they have in the national security domain and how long their tenure lasts, you see there is zero institutional understanding of war and the trends in irregular warfare. Last uh, report we did, I'll summarize very quickly because it is, of course, threat du jour, and that is the Islamic State and information warfare. This was done by the Threat Knowledge Group, and uh, I was the, uh, the lead uh, director for, for this whole project. Uh, the cons the, uh, the uh, conclusions with regards to ISIS, as an example of the future face of warfare, are that ISIS is without doubt, if you just look at the empirical data, far, far more dangerous than Al-Qaeda. Number one, it is a fully-fledged insurgency. Al-Qaeda never really was. Al-Qaeda was a parasitic organism that latched itself onto groups such as the Taliban or Al-Shabaab. This is a group that controls territory larger than the, the United Kingdom today. Second, it is the richest threat group in modern history. After the second raid on the Iraqi National Bank, ISIS walked away with $823 million in dollars not dinars. That is the equivalent of 1,600 9-11s in terms of the sheer cost. Thirdly, it has recruited, latest estimates, more than 19,000 foreign fighters. General uh, Cleveland at a recent panel here in DC called that staggering, and he is absolutely right, and it did so in just a matter of months. Most of this is due to its very sophisticated understanding of social media, something which Al-Qaeda really never got. Uh, penultimately, it has declared caliphate. This is very, very important. After 90 years of absence, after Ataturk dissolved the empire in 1924, many people talked about it, from Hassan al-Banna to Said Qutb to bin Laden himself and to Zawahiri. Only one threat group has actually done it on June the 30th last year, and that is Abu Bakr and ISIS. Last, uh, two problems. It has currently no peer competitor. I'm very glad the Jordanians are taking the fight to ISIS, but in the history of modern air power, since the first hand grenade was tossed out of a biplane, the number of insurgencies that have been uh, destroyed by air power is a resounding zero doesn't matter what theater we're talking about, boots on the ground will be necessary, hopefully Arab boots on the ground. And lastly, it is growing. So, uh, conclusions with regards to what to do with ISIS. We have to understand this is a counter-ideological war. Information warfare and psychological operations should be the first tool of military resort. At the moment, it is treated as the last, as an appendix in uh, operational planning. You can win many wars without firing a shot if your counter-ideological operations, your strategic communications are up to snuff. 
Second, you cannot engage in a war of ideas if you do not understand the enemy's ideas. Uh, we brought in the former director of Voice of America, Bob Riley, a stunning author on these issues, and he put it a little a bit more uh, trenchantly. He said, you can't win a war of ideas if you don't have an idea. We don't have an idea why we are fighting and what our political end state is. And the idea that this is just about Syria and Iraq, that's not what Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi believes. And thirdly, in order to win a morally based war of ideas, and it is moral, if you think you can burn a man alive and be just in doing so, it's not because you're crazy. Read the Twitter feeds, read the dark web after the immolation. ISIS spent a lot of time religiously and theologically justifying the murder of uh, Officer Kasasbe. We need, in the morally driven fight, to have organizational and financial means that span generations. Those are wholly absent right now, especially after the dissolution of USIA. Uh, if you want to go deeper, um, for the Special Warfare magazine, for the operators at Bragg, uh, I wrote an article on the enemy threat doctrine uh, of uh, the groups we face today, like ISIS. And if you want the grad level uh, analysis, uh, my wife published a book on fighting the ideological war. Those are, are both uh, available uh, online. Lastly, if I may just uh, inject a personal note. Um, neoliberalism. As a man who grew up under Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and who read The Road to Serfdom, the idea that Milton Friedman and Margaret Thatcher are responsible for and created the drug cartels of the world is a rather aggressive rewriting of history. Uh, Milton Friedman, uh, Hayek von Mises, and even the politicians that embraced their concepts were not amoral. The whole point of what they were trying to do was based on the moral content, a belief in objective morality, and not just the market does everything. So I would uh, suggest or request from my fellow panelists who see drug cartels as the future of governance uh, not to conflate neoliberalism with crony capitalism. Those are two different concepts, and neoliberalism uh, 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 must be separated from crony capitalism. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, those are my contact details. If you want to know more about the project that was done for General Cleveland, then uh, threatknowledgegroup.org is the place to go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gorka. So we have a little bit of a controversy. Uh, if we didn't, I would think that was uh, we had failed. Um, now, um, rather than trying to summarize, I think if we can uh, we can take some questions. Uh, and please identify yourself. Wait for the microphone, and ask a question, all the way in the back. Thank you. Susan Barnes, uh, DOD. OK, a little bit of um, observation, and then it can be a bit of a question. We heard about um, the post-Westphalian uh, failed state, sort of a neo-feudalism as institutions break down, uh, a riff a bit about uh, psyops against uh, ISIS. I would say that there is some hope, Pandora style, in the uh, non-state or, or meta-state globalism, and that is the media. Even though ISIS uh, practices what one commentator I heard on the car this weekend referred to as jihadi snuff movies uh, to uh, target a very uh, particular, perhaps millennial adolescent. Uh, nevertheless, I think the potential for discourse through the arts, through the same kind of internet media, offers a degree of hope, but if you think of it only in terms of a political psyop, that too is limited. I'll go back farther in history than the Treaty of Westphalia. I'll go to the fall of the Roman Empire and the major critique of the criticism there that it was because of wimpy Christianity, 
uh, but Augustine and his maybe totalistic, or maybe his, the application of his ideas were totalistic, uh, his critique of the Roman state, but also his positing of a higher moral order. While I don't say that one needs a particular transcendent religious view, I would say the potential and the necessity for really talking things out as to what is human dignity is there. It exists because of our new media, and that really would be the way to address the most heinous crimes that we have, but also perhaps create the new institutions that you need as well. And I just leave that as an observation and comment. Thank you. So is there a question? Uh, sir, right here. My name is uh, Randall Fort. I'm with Raytheon. Um, during the course of all the presentations, um, there were a few mentions of new um, and uh, radically changing technology, such as 3D printing. Um, just wondered if you could maybe um, go a little bit further in taking a look at 3D printing, at nanotechnology, at Internet of Things, at autonomous systems, at bioinformatics, synthetic biology, the combination of all these things. Uh, going forward, from the, the mention of 3D printing for an example, um, they're currently 3D printing pizza, that's called food, so we've just solved the hunger problem if we can print food um, as one sort of future outcome. So do you see those technologies in the aggregate as being dystopian, utopian, or somewhere in between? I'm not sure. Was that directed to anyone in particular or to the panel in general? Anyone feel ready to answer it, Greg? Well, it's a great question, and I don't have a terrific answer for it. My general proposition about technology would be that that um, break, breakthroughs take a long time to break through, that we have the technology created, and then it takes a long time for the social and political circumstances to make it work. Look at the Internet. It was around in the 60s in a crude form. It took 30 years for it to become uh, a part of our lives. Now, I think that process is accelerated. But if you thought about something like, we've been talking about nanotechnology for a generation now and haven't seen much of it. So my guess is we will see the pace get quicker and the combined, as you suggest, effect of these things mattering more than we have in the past. Uh, in that sense, I suppose information technology is an interesting example where once it actually it took a long time to gestate, but once it came to the fore, it moved very dramatically particularly through mostly cell phones, basically. But uh, that acceleration, I think, is likely to, to be characteristic of other technologies as well. I'm always interested, though, in the, one, the things that don't happen. Right? Uh, if, if we'd been having a conversation about energy in 1950, we would assume that energy was free because of nuclear energy, but the politics and societal factors didn't go that direction. Or uh, by now, you'd assume we'd have a lot better batteries than we have. So it's, it's, it's always, I'm always intrigued by the kind of dogs that don't bark in this realm as well. Thank you, Greg. So uh, I think that's a great question. Um, I, uh, I, I've lived and worked for most of my career in the Silicon Valley, where technological optimism is the reigning ideology. And, uh, and I share it. I think you know, most of the, all the technology, technologies you described are going to create huge amounts of human benefit. But the thing that Silicon Valley fundamentally misses, but that most people in Washington understand, is that technology creates both winners and losers. And what it doesn't do is get rid of politics, which is a debate about values and ends. And the question about where to, where, how technology actually gets deployed in practice is, in fact, a political and social question that takes years to, to, to get resolved in many cases. So I think the notion that we're going to sort of reach a utopia, we may have more material abundance, which will solve certain kinds of problems, but it's also going to create certain kinds of losers uh, inevitably as technology emerges. I mean, if we 3D print, print pizza, there's a lot of pizza people who are going to go out of business, right? And that's the trivial example. Um, so I think that we have to look comprehensively at the way in which politics will continue to endure as a debate about ends. And this is where I completely agree with what, what Dr. Gorka had to say. What ISIS's appeal is, is that we have a sort of morally evacuated Western civilization now where what exactly we're here for other than creating more technology and having better video games is not entirely clear, whereas ISIS has a very clear narrative about an alternative social and moral vision. Now, we may find that abhorrent, but there's obviously at least 19,000 people who are willing to put their lives on the line 
in favor of that vision over playing more video games and having nanotechnology and 3D printing, and that's what we need to take seriously, it seems to me. Uh, I, I just uh, reinforce what Dr. Gilman said. Uh, this may sound very un-American, but it is very, very wise to be enormously skeptical about technology. Uh, remember, we had the RMA back in the 1990s, and for the last 13 years, what was the deadliest weapon used against our forces? Ammonium nitrate, IEDs, and artillery shells connected to wires that were detonated. 100 yards away. So technology is never a silver bullet. Zero silver bullet panacea to be found in technology because it has to be used by somebody. Is a book good or bad? Is a knife good or bad? Is a gun good or bad? Context. So technology is something that is morally neutral and has to be given content and applied based upon strategic concepts. And, and to our, our speech about social media, uh, I would love it if social media were the enemy of all the bad guys. But ask yourself, how deep can you get on a tweet into Thomistic philosophy or Augustine philosophy? <laughs> not really, yeah, not really. Social media is not good for the deep moral uh, debates that have to be had today that are the core of things such as ISIS uh, immolating that fighter pilot. Uh, Islam is in a philosophical quandary. A thousand years ago, it removed reason and natural law in a debate between two theological groups, the Asherites and the Mutazilites. I've just exceeded a tweet with that one sentence talking about the role of natural law in Islam. So again, be very skeptical and see these as value neutral. They may be good for us, they may be good for the enemy. Uh, last comment on this. Yeah, uh, yeah very Williams. quickly. I, I think it can be a qualifier, right? I've got all these trends, but for example, desalination. If you can make it um, much cheaper, and I think cost is a factor, then you could deal with some of the water crises we have in, in parts of the world already. I hope we're also gonna, gonna get a chance to respond on neoliberalism. Uh, we'll take one more. Uh, front row. This has been an amazing morning. Thank you. Um, I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. When are you going to get this discussion in the domain that most people read? When is this going to be a front page story in Time Magazine, the New York Times Sunday Magazine? I mean, if it's just among interesting intellectuals, it doesn't move forward. My question is, based on what you're saying, what should we be teaching in our military academies? Thank you. Let's start with uh, Dr. Gorka. Not the, what we do today. Okay. <laughs> I was just warming up. What we do today, with the, the odd exception, and I doff my cap to those, is we teach the history of strategy. I mean, you can damn the Potomac with courses on the Peloponnesian Wars. That's pretty useless, unless you want to be a historian. I don't teach the history of strategy when I teach. I teach how to do strategy. And that's a big difference, yeah? Not describing, the, the whole case study thing is a problem for me. I'm not interested in case studies qua case studies. I'm interested in how you apply concepts of prioritization. Think about the QDRs of the last 20 years or the NSS that was just recently published. Every QDR, every NSS for the last 15 years, irrespective of which administration wrote them, are the antithesis of strategy. They are laundry lists. We're going to do more wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. We're going to fight China and the China Seas. We're going to save the whales and the polar bears and stop global warming. That is the antithesis of strategy. Strategy requires the identification of priorities, of weighing interests, of starting with a discussion of what is the national interest in Afghanistan? Really, what is the US national interest in Syria? Have we had that discussion? So I would like to see a couple of things. Uh, stick to the basics of how you do strategy, and on top of that, hugely lacking, the strategic 
culture of non-Western civilizations. Not just Sun Tzu as a throwaway for one class, but analyze Japanese strategic culture. In, I can't even think of a course on Indian strategic culture at a main PME organization. These are the things we should be teaching. How other cultures look at strategy. Because our biggest sin, and look, I'm a recently minted American. Don't get me wrong. I love my country. Our biggest sin is mirror imaging. We walk into South Asia and we think that tribal leader means yes when he says yes to us over a cup of chai. Are you kidding? He has social mores, historic mores that go back 600 years that are driven by his tribe's attitude to Alexander the Great and the Tsars of Russia, and you think he means yes because he said it to you? So uh, the, 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 cultural, the, the, the strategic culture of other civilizations and how to do strategy. That would be on my druthers. Thank you. Next. Uh, <clears throat> maybe just uh, uh, two quick words. Um, one of my watchwords comes from a Marine student of mine in, 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 the, in Iraq when things started to go bad. I asked him how it was going, and he said, we're a football team, he said. They're asking us to dance the ballet. And since we're good athletes, we do our best, but we're fundamentally a football team. Uh, that, to me, takes, takes me in the direction of a certain humility about what we can do, where we can engage, and for what purposes. It's no knock on uh, that, that football team. It's an awfully good football team, but it is a football team. Uh, and that, that means, it seems to me, that we ought to have a certain humility about what we think we can do uh, in d distant places, foreign cultures, all those things. We, we need to do better at understanding them, but there's always, it seems to me, going to be the, the fundamental constraint of that mostly a football team. Thank you. But back in January, I heard Scott Mann, uh, who runs the Stability Institute, uh, former Green Beret, talk about, the con talk about contract societies, which we are, and honor and status societies. And it fits very much with this cultural and how we don't understand each other and how the US has failed in Afghanistan and Afghanistan to understand the honor and status society that give impulse to everything. But since I've got the microphone, let me go back to neoliberalism. Uh, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still smarting, right? Um, neoliberalism, I would argue, is an ideology and it's an ideology about the role of the state. And that has consequences, and some of those consequences are unintended. They can be as moral as they want. The unintended consequences are about the rise of criminal organizations and a variety of other things. And let me clarify one thing on alternative governance. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's a future. I'm suggesting that in many parts of the world, it's the only form of governance that exists. Take a look at Mike Davis' Planet of Slums. He talks about the slums, and he said, any notion the state, that states are trying to do anything about this in large parts of the world, to believe that, you've got to be hallucinating or on something. So I think, I think that's, that's really important. And the other component of this, in many parts of the world, the illicit economy is the only economy that works. Thank you. Dr. Gilman, any final comment? Um, we have one. I'm going to take a little bit of extra time because we do have a, uh, a question coming in from the live stream uh, from Gary Milanti of the Swedish... International Peace Research Institute. Question for Dr. Gilman, so you will get the final say. Where do the plutocracies you describe end? Uh, he goes on further to say, proceeds from their industries, illicit or illicit, are mostly consumed in the formal economy. They buy real estate in safe havens and send their children to our universities, use international financial systems that we in the formal economy have created and protect to do this. Our companies enjoy profits from transfer pricing and missing regulations, environmental labor, and are the states and the liberal economies financing and protecting these systems, selling the rope for our own noose? Well, the short answer, I think, is yes. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I mean, if you look at, uh, there's about 2,000 billionaires in the world now. Um, there's about 16 million uh, millionaires um, in the world. And uh, the question is, I mean, and the, something like 80% of the world's assets are controlled by those 16 million people. Um, and they basically have taken control over the world economy and what they decide to do, what those people decide to do is, is the future of the world economy. So it's very important, it seems to me, to emphasize 
the outreach to that group as well about the structure of the economy, uh, of the global economy. The rise of the plutocratic insurgency, as I label it, is not, not all 16 million people in that group or even the 2,000 billionaires necessarily subscribe to that, uh, that kind of a notion or are engaged in a plutocratic insurgency. But in many parts of the world, particularly actually in the global south, the notion that they should invest in creation of public goods has been progressively evacuated even as a norm that people are supposed to uh, give lip service to. It's, uh, you know, there's patronage and things that happen um, of, of one sort and another, but for the most part, uh, in places like Latin America or Africa or much of South Asia, the notion of the collective good is not something that uh, the very rich feel that they need to pay much uh, direct service to. Thank you, Dr. Gilman. Final word, uh, Dr. Gorka. Uh, Do I get counter response? <laughs> Do we leave it? Do we strengthen it? Do we target it? What do we do? Okay, final word. All right. I think one thing that uh, I suspect all, all of us here agree on, not sure about the audience, is that the labels of good guy and bad guy are not very strategic labels. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bring this to a close uh, with just with a couple of final uh, comments. One is that we talked a little bit about technology, and I just want to uh, mention I was asked earlier, an hour and a half ago, and I completely forgot, that for those of you who have something to do with Twitter, we have a hashtag. It's hashtag beyond, uh, beyond convergence. Uh, so whatever you do with Twitter, that's the hashtag. Um, we are going to take a 15 or so minute break, but uh, you know, one of the extraordinary things about being in Washington is no matter how ordinary you are, if you stay here long enough, you get to meet and work with amazing people. Uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking this panel for being amazing this morning. Okay, that coffee that you were waiting for earlier, it's here. If you guys could just stay here for one minute, and if the members of the second panel could meet in the green room. Testing, one, two, three. Ladies and gentlemen, if you take your seats, we'll get started with the second uh, panel. Have everybody come in. We're ready to get started. Have them come in, we're ready to get started.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll please take your seats. Thank you. And we have your slides, right? Actually, I'm going to run. I'm going to run back and get them to load it up so you can see right now. Got Helfstein slides. Yeah, he's loaded. He's loaded. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please take your seats. We're going to rev up again. We're a few minutes behind schedule, uh, so I'm not going to make any opening remarks on this panel. Um, I'm just going to turn it directly over to the panelists. Just remember, uh, for you tweeterers, hashtag beyond convergence. And um, we'll uh, please save our applause and our questions until all the panelists have spoken. And then we'll go to the audience for comments and participation. Thank you. And Dr. Helfstein, to you. Thank you, Michael. Hashtag, let's fire it up. <laughs> Round two. Um, so I am really happy to be here this morning. Uh, I wear two hats. Um, I am part of the plutocratic insurgency at uh, BNY Mellon. And uh, I am also a non-resident fellow and former research director from uh, the Military Academy and the Combating Terrorism Center. So I am more here in, in that guy, so, so trying not to be an insurgent, which is what I put on my security clearance form almost 10 years ago, that I had not tried to overthrow the government. So uh, there's a lot of debate within government, has gone on for a long time, and a lot of debate within academia that talks about the convergence of threats. And obviously, Michael's book really um, uh, did a great job in addressing that issue. What had been lacking for a really long time, I believe, was a comprehensive picture. And so now I get to rewind, and it keeps going back further in time as I do this. So it's now about five years ago that we were sitting around the table up at West Point. And at the time, we had Somali pirates taking ships. We saw the first beheadings in Mexico. We were rolling out our own crime, terror, peace in Afghanistan uh, at the West Point, which would be followed up by uh, Peace on Haqqani Financing, some great work that uh, Gretchen did over the years. And we kept coming back to the same issue, that we were having a really tough time discerning what was terrorism, what was criminality, where the lines of finance ran, how corruption worked. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next. And so at CTC, we taught, teach cadets, um, research and advise. And we kept having people kind of come in and asking us about these issues. And we could rehash anecdotes. We could talk about Dawood Abrahim um, and D Company. Um, we could talk about Victor Bout. We could talk about some of Al Qaeda's connections. Matt will obviously uh, get into Hezbollah as the preeminent expert. Um, well, I will now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there was really no comprehensive assessment of what this looked like. And we didn't really have a good way until, by the way, we built out our network and came across a company that had been built 
uh, to do financial compliance and was gathering in an unclass fashion data on illicit activities from individuals and it was from 80 countries and 60 languages. And from an intelligence standpoint, this database in terms of moving on active threats is going to be a little bit behind the curve. But for financial compliance terms, it provides a resource for the private sector to go and bounce names against, which is one of the things that they have to do in post 9-11 regulation. Next, please. Yes. So we were actually able to go and mine their database. And we set up a re uh, an experiment of sorts. Working with DEA, FBI, some other law enforcement, we put together a list of 40 top transnational smugglers across guns, narcotics, people, financing, and use this database, which was in dossier format, and so it was incredibly tedious for us to go and scrape information, but they had in the dossiers, because it was mainly built off of court records, indictments and convictions, they had known associates. And we were able to leverage that information, scrape it up, and put it into a network. And so we could actually see across these activities where are these overlapping boundaries. And so just to give you a sense of scope, we started with 40. We went sort of one degree out. If we play Kevin Bacon, we had 754. And then what would take about six more months would be to scrape all the connections for those 754. And that was an additional 1,900. So in the end, we had a database of almost 2,800 people across the world. And we had the connections by which they had you know, done business participated in illicit activity. So when we put all this together, we started with our 40. That little cluster, by the way, is some uh, drug activity in, in Latin America. We had this hypothesis that we would see connections across either illicit industry, OK, so drug dealers are, are going to know each other. Um, you know, drug traffickers, and so if you're doing narcotics in South America, and you're doing narcotics in South Asia, perhaps there's some tenuous, right, the North Africa connection, some tenuous contact. Now, there's a regional dynamic. If you're selling guns in South America, you're probably selling guns to some of the cartels, and so there's regional connectivity. And that's what we initially focused on. As we built it out, it took pretty much no time for the network to converge. That was the 754. It converges into nine subgroups immediately. And then by the time we're done with 2700, 98% are subsumed in the common network. Now the really nice part about this is the database, because it was built largely off of court records, a little bit of open source reporting as well, had already coded the activities that people were doing. So if you're coded a terrorist, it's because you were on somebody's watch list or you were indicted or convicted of terrorist activities. Likewise, if you're in there for narcotics, it's because those were the charges brought against you in some jurisdiction. And so we didn't have to go in and make the judgment call about what people were doing and whether it was illicit or not. The court records and the coding before us had taken care of that. So in a sense, it's double blind. And so here we were, we put this together, 98% are subsumed within the single network. Now, I'm not here telling you that there's some Dr. Evil sitting there saying, we need to connect these people, and we need to build this massive specter network of, which by the way, I think that's right, the new James Bond bad guy, I think they're bringing back specter. So there's no, there, there's no specter out there. Right? This is a self-organizing network of 2,700 individuals who happen to cross paths and do business with one another. Just to give you a sense of cross-activity, we can start with the narcotic smugglers. We can add in some organized crime and corruption, and then layer in terrorism. And this, to us, was 
sort of the biggest surprise. Because we knew by the coding that we were picking up terrorists. We knew that, in fact, there were almost as many terrorists as narcotics smugglers by the time we were done. But what we didn't really have a good sense of was how they fit into the network. And there was a really good argument to be made that they exist in one little chunk. And it turns out that that's not true. They're actually distributed across the network. And not only that, they serve as a bridge between lots of other illicit groups that might not necessarily connect to one another. And in part, it's because they're inherently transnational in a lot of their activities. Because even if they are a local-oriented insurgent group, they're probably bringing money in from outside. Or they probably need some sanctuary somewhere outside of the country to operate it. And so they're transnational in orientation, just like our transnational criminal entities. So we didn't see them all in one place. So that whole idea that normatively criminals won't work with terrorists because it's unpatriotic or they won't do that type of thing, or terrorists are beyond the pale, um, doesn't really hold up. And so when we finished, this is sort of layering the last group, which we refer to as suspicious individuals. And these might be... Um, people who are not yet brought out on indictments, but are flowing through the financial system. And interestingly here, right, this is evidence in a sense of how important it is for these people in the illicit space to bridge the illicit and the illicit. And the fact that they really can't operate solely in one of those spaces. Now, those are some really cool pictures. But part of the problem is with big data, right? Which, by the way, 2,800 people, that's a 3 million point data set. So we're not Google big, but I think for US government, this is, you know, US government big. And it's very hard to get a sense of really what's going on in that ball of yarn. I can tell you 98% are connected, I could throw out some statistics, but really, we have to get used to not just thinking about the visuals, we have to get used to thinking about the data as well. And so we could actually go and test and empirically say that, by the way, the terrorists are some of the best connected people in this network. It's not that the criminals want nothing to do with them. It's that they bridge criminals. They're a vibrant part. Interestingly enough, organized crime, they have a really small footprint. I suspect because they've been doing this for a really long time. And so if you think about operational security, they actually look the way we expected most of, the, most of the cells to look. But the terrorists, the narcotic smugglers, very different. If we lay it geographically on the map, we don't, by the way, have a massive crime terror problem in Kansas. <laughs> it's simply because from a latitude and longitude standpoint, um, you know, we just did center mass of each country. Um, I will, you know, do the shout out. Google did offer to help. The company we were working with, however, at the time, uh, did not want to share their data with Google, which you can understand. So we did not do exact lot, la uh, longitude latitude. But it wouldn't matter because our 2,700 people have 15,000 relationships. If we were to map those out across this map, you wouldn't see the map. This is a map with a thousand lines. This represents the country to country transnational relationships. And there are over a thousand of them. And so that's a geographic look at what the network looks like. And then there's the question of where and how. Why does this occur? And the argument we normally make is this failed state argument. And we heard a lot about that in the last panel, right? Demographics, governance, um, that, you know, governance gets eroded, and then therefore we can we can see these convergent threats. Well, the nice part is we could actually go and test this because now we had all this data. We had the activities people were doing. We had convergence and we could overlay it on the map. And so in fact, what we found is that it wasn't the ones that we think about. It wasn't the failed states. It wasn't Somalia because quite frankly, you don't really need you know, to have a sophisticated operation in Somalia to go rob a bank if you're a terrorist group. There's really nobody to stop you in most places of Somalia from robbing it. 
Similarly, if you want to you know, control a city in Somalia, you know, and you're an organized crime group, you don't need to go and outsource to terrorists who are really good at it. And so one of the things we, we sort of argue, and, and I think uh, Dr. Williams teed this up beautifully um, on the governance side, is not a desire to govern, right? It's this parasitic dynamic. It's negative political control. They don't want to provide services. They will when they have to in the bare minimum, but they want to deny others the ability to operate in certain space. And where do we see that? Well, we see that in places where it's hard to operate. High capability countries have high levels of convergence. The other one that we were surprised about is state-sponsored criminality. Because we've talked about state-sponsored terrorism for a really long time in the counterterrorism community. But there's really no analogy. We've kind of turned our back. All of us who work in it professionally know that states are tangentially involved. And this was brought up as well in the last panel. But it turns out that you know, weak states who tend to get into fights with their neighbors have an incentive to go and maintain criminal enterprises. And we've seen this again and again. And so we shouldn't just be looking at how states are supporting terrorist groups, but we should be looking more as well at how states have fostered their relationships with criminal enterprises. And this was, in a sense, the missing hand that we saw in the data. Because we knew that there were groups that were converging. We couldn't really explain why. And then finally, as we got into the data and began to understand this, it's because, quite frankly, there were probably state intelligence agencies that were behind building a lot of these relationships that we didn't see. It was the invisible hand, in a sense. We could see the product of their work, but we couldn't see them. Because quite frankly, they're better at staying hidden than a lot of transnational criminals. Thanks in large part to you know, people in this room and, and elsewhere throughout the government. So I, I really, I think I want to end, though, um, after all that, that we sort of thought about um, on this project, and all the debates that have taken place. For me, I'm pretty comfortable with the empirical data. And so I'm pretty much done arguing whether there is or is not convergence. I'm sorry. I've done a lot of work on this. It was two years of my life. And I'm going to say I'm pretty comfortable saying there's convergence. Now, there are some important questions. The nature of convergence remains to be a question. And Perhaps the most important question is the strategic value. Is this really a strategic threat? And I had to reflect on this for a while after the project, so I didn't really have a great answer. And I think now I'm comfortable in saying, I see this as a force multiplier in a very classic security studies sort of way. This network exists as a force multiplier for our enemies. It allows them to execute surprise in ways that we don't, that, that, you know, are going to continue to challenge us. It's going to allow them to move into cyber realm. It's going to allow them to move back and forth um, in terms of their movement of money and their movement of arms. It's going to allow them to be nimble. And it's going to allow them to strike the way that the terrorists want with a much greater impact than the local brute force of the explosion alone. And so to the extent that we view those enemies as a strategic threat, then I think we need to consider how we're going to handle the force multiplier to really damage their capabilities going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, Doug Farrell. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I think that uh, what Scott presented was really, for people like me, the, uh, great because we had been relying on our own experience, on anecdotes, on things we'd seen, and to finally have some empirical data to be able to say, okay, we're not imagining it, we don't, we're not uh, fantasizing about this because we can see it on the ground, but to, quali to make it into a, into a data set was, I think, uh, tremendously important. So I, I'm really grateful for that, 
for that work. I want to touch on a couple of things that were said in the, in the first panel. I'm going to restructure what I was going to say a little bit because I think some of the things they said were, were really good and I think it plays into this. And one is, uh, it was it mentioned earlier, one of the, our challenges is uh, going forward is the displacement of our, our values. And I think that that is a systematic uh, concerted effort across the Western Hemisphere that you're seeing now in ways that we are very little examined and, and very well financed and very well uh, thought out. I also want to touch a little bit on the role. You know, we talked a lot about failed states, et cetera. I, I'm beginning to argue more and more forcefully myself, and, and I think I've, I've convinced myself uh, that we're not, we're very seldom, especially in the Western Hemisphere, we're not seeing failed states. We're seeing states that are consciously making a decision to act as criminal enterprises in ways that we do not think states should behave, but which are entirely state-driven from their conscious decision to pursue transnational organized crime in the support of insurgencies as instruments of power, as instruments of sustenance for their governments. Particularly, I'm talking about Venezuela, uh, the Bolivarian countries, Bolivia, Ecuador, and now Nicaragua, and, and certainly El Salvador. Um, and I think that one of the other things that was mentioned earlier in this was the, the desire to create, create within these societies zones of autonomy. And I think he's seeing that increasingly across the Northern Triangle, particularly of Central America, where that is exactly what the gangs want. There's this idea that we have the gangs want to reintegrate. If we could just reach out to them, nonsense. I've spent a lot of time with them over the last decade, and their vision of utopia is, be, is, is an entirely separate entity from the state and all that surrounds it. They're, 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 I, liked, I hadn't thought of it as zones of autonomy. I think that's ex exactly uh, right. And what you see now, and as you see them approach this, uh, it, it converges with their sense of political awareness, both, I would argue, in Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador, particularly in other parts of, of the region, with a growing sense of political awareness, that they can and exercise uh, negotiations with the state, they can win in those negotiations, and that they have a real political power that they hadn't been aware of before. And I think you see this both in the, in the criminal world, uh, I was. I went because I'd heard this rumor for many years that it existed, and I didn't believe it. I went to a little town in El Paraiso in Honduras, right on the Guatemalan border, because I had heard that the local narco who runs that town had built a replica of the White House as his as the mayor's office. And uh, son of a gun, if it isn't true, and we have pictures. I mean, it is the most amazing thing uh, to come up over and look in this valley, and you see there's the White House standing in this, in this godforsaken town with one little dirt road leading into it. What, what does this mean it, to me? It means that these groups are not, as Scott said, looking necessarily for national political power. But there is an increasing movement across the region, among gangs particularly, and specific types of organized crime, particularly drug traffickers, to insert themselves ever more into the local political structure, which then bleeds up into the national political structure. So if you look at the Guatemalan border, this is the Sacapa region uh, in, in Guatemala, where I'm spending a lot of time these days, every narco has a local mayor, or is a local mayor, uh, and then they have direct contacts with spe a specific political structure in the National Assembly that will guarantee that the laws that they want passed are passed or won't be passed, etc. But it, it's not a direct line, but it's, it's increasingly, and they're making the conscious decision, there's a guy named Tres Quiebres now, one of the big new narcos in Colombia, uh, in, uh, in Guatemala, who's running for mayor of his town in Sacapa and in, in, in Ipales, right outside Sacapa, because he wants the political power. Uh, Alex Ardon, who runs El Paraiso, where they built the White House, wanted that political power. He didn't aspire to run Honduras. He aspired to run his valley, and people loved him. And as was talked before, he provided an enormous amount of services that the state never had. He put in electricity, not only for his town, but for all the surrounding hamlets. He's paved their streets. He put in an AstroTurf. This is the most amazing thing you'll ever see in the middle of nowhere, an AstroTurf football field with a little sign-up sheet so the local teams can go and pick out what hours they want to play and practice. I mean, it's, it's things that these people had never imagined in their life that anyone would provide for them. The state certainly never did, and so, uh, and so they're, moving, uh, they're moving forward. So I do think that there is a, a growing political component to what we're seeing, and I, again, I think it's more of a, 
of a local phenomenon to start with, but it is gradually affecting uh, up the chain of command. And where it's most visible in my experience recently is, is with the gangs. What do you, what uh, did you, we just see in El Salvador, what do, you, what do you see in El Salvador right now in this electoral cycle heading up for the March 1st elections? Opposition candidates have to pay the gangs to be able to go into their territory to campaign. If you don't think that that's an inversion of traditional political power, and why? Because the government has been guaranteed 300,000 votes by certain sectors of the gangs. They're going to be voting for the FMLN in this particular election. If the other guys want to get into the campaign at all, they're paying the gangs, and they will tell you this, it's not, a, it's not a, a secret, they now have to pay to access certain areas of the city to be able to carry out their campaigns. When the gangs began carrying out systematic campaigns in certain uh, neighborhoods around uh, and outside of the capital in El Salvador, what was, the, what was the police response? Did they go in and save the city and reestablish order? They went in and escorted the citizens out under armed guards so they could peacefully leave their homes and leave their villages to the, to the gangs. That is a pretty compelling view of the political power that these groups now operate in conjunction again, and this is where I go back to the criminalized states, with states that permit this and in fact, in the case of El Salvador, and you see it in certain sectors in Honduras and Guatemala, where the state reaches out to the gang to carry out specific, specific political agendas that they want carried out in a way that we would say a state can't do and yet the state does. So I think that the idea that the state is absent is often true, but also I think it's overblown because I think often in these particular contexts, and you see it clearly, I think, also in much more developed countries like Argentina, where you have the governments now reaching out specifically to criminalize groups to carry out specific state policies that make their, that make their agenda, uh, that advance their agenda at the expense of, of, uh, of the people. So I think that the nature of convergence, as Scott mentioned, that, is, is I think in question because I think it's very, very different across a spectrum of activities. That, and we, and it's, we want, and I want, often to see something that I can say, okay, this is it. I've got the model now. I can see the paradigm. And it's not. I mean, or it, or it is in that little corner, but it's completely different over here. It doesn't mean the convergence isn't happening or the groups aren't, aren't converging. No, it simply means that it takes on different forms and, and it's constantly morphing and it's not an, it's, so it's not easy to say, okay, this is exactly what we're looking at because in three months it will be different from what you, what you, were, uh, what you were just looking at. So you, and going, and then going, returning to the criminalized state theory, if you have states like Venezuela that are willing to use drug trafficking and the FARC as instruments of their foreign policy. What does this do in the allied states around it? And you, I think the same thing happens uh, in Ecuador with, with President Correa. You have a knock-on effect where you generate enormous amounts of money coming out of these, criminalized, these criminal activities, state-sponsored, that then need what? They need other states that will help them to launder the proceeds of their money and keep their political project going. Because I think at the end of the day, there is a political project. I don't think the Bolivarian revolution is pure nonsense, uh, well, maybe pure nonsense. In their minds, it's not pure nonsense. It's how they, how they view it. They actually have something that they want to accomplish. And as they do that, they have built an enormous network, and I've done some writing on this, but not a, gr a great deal, and maybe someday in PRISM it will appear, uh, looking at the concerted and well-funded uh, drive to fully disarticulate U.S. military doctrine in the region. There are new uh, military academies being set up. They're well-funded. The Iranians are f helping to fund one. The Argentines are funding another. The Venezuelans are funding a third. Where they're explicit on their websites, they say our goal is to eradicate any vestige of U.S. military doctrine in the region. There's no, it's not a mystery, it's not, you know, some hidden agenda. They're very clear about this. Why? Because as they bring the extra regional actors into play, particularly the Russians and the Iranians and, and the Chinese, the one thing these groups have in common besides the, the need to, the desire to do business together, and, and there's a lot of money there, is, I, and this is my fundamental argument for the national security element of it, the one thing that they all have in common is a great desire to hurt the United States. It's the empire, it's the world power, it's the one thing that they would like to knock off uh, its stride in, in a serious way. And they're not talking about peaceful methods. If you read their literature, and someone in the first panel, they talked about knowing what these guys think.
thing. We don't spend much time reading what these guys say. And what do they say in their literature? They say, we have not only the right, but the duty to use weapons of mass destruction to attack the United States, Venezuelan military doctrine. Do we take that seriously? I think we probably should start thinking about it. When bin Laden said in 1996, I'm gonna attack the United States, we all thought there's this crazy little guy up in a cave, can't possibly happen. Now you're talking about real states with real money and real military capacity, saying not on one occasion, on repeated occasions and quite publicly, what their intention is. Do they have the capacity? No. Will they get the capacity if they keep going like the Energizer Bunny because no one's paying attention? I would argue that, that yes. So as these resources flow out, because it's very difficult, I think, for these states to keep a lid or to manage the criminal proceeds of their, of their enterprises in, in a neat and easy way, and they don't want, even in, in the Bolivarian countries, there can be some congressional oversight, et cetera. They've created a series of other networks of friendly governments, particularly in the case of, Nicar of uh, Venezuela and Nicaragua and El Salvador where you now have specific networks in those countries managing close to a billion dollars a year in extrajudicial budgets that are essentially uh, slush funds for those governments and for the broader project, which includes bringing the FARC to power in Colombia, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that as you look across the region and you see the, the, the zones of autonomy, I mean, what, the, what they have carved out with uh, Albanisa and Alba Petróleos in, in, in Central America are economic zones of autonomy that manage probably cumulatively in the last three or four years, three or four billion dollars. We know that uh, Alba Petróleos this year is declared in 2013, it grows, at, grows about 40% a year. They're managing what they admit to is $864 million in unaccounted for funds that flow through them. Daniel Ortega has said that he has five or six hundred million dollars a year that he doesn't have to account for because they flow through Albanisa uh, to him. So you're talking about states that n exercise state power on one hand and at the same time exercise, create an autonomous zones where they can manage other money that isn't in the state uh, for their own, for their own uh, benefit. And I don't think it's entirely p personal corruption. There is a, a, an underlying political dynamic and a desire to create a world that may not be particularly well defined, uh, in which I think the one thing that they all agree on is that they would like to be in power for as long as they can be into perpetuity, and that is one of the, de driving, the driving goals of that, of that structure. So I think that you're, we're facing multiple actors and multiple, doing multiple things in ways that, that make states uh, the Westphalian state system much less relevant in ways that we have, as was mentioned in the first panel, we don't have the tools and we don't have the thinking to deal with them. Uh, you'll hear this afternoon from, uh, from a person who talks about the, the in, we'll talk I think about the intelligence culture and the, and the lack of ability to move our analysis from what we really like because it's, we like to watch states and we like to think if the guy says yes, it means yes. And we like to think that if you pay the amount of money you're supposed to pay, you get that service that should be rendered to you and, and that you can build alliances with people who study in the United States because gee, they teach, they speak English and it's so easy to talk with them. And that is simply, I would argue, no longer true in many, many cases across the board. And as we limit ourselves to those kinds of interactions and to that kind of analysis, we see an, ever, I would say, a very, an expanding uh, autonomous zones, both uh, in political action and, uh, and, and economics. And I think that, and I'll just close with this, I think the, the biggest, my biggest uh, sort of concern looking at across Latin America is not only the gangs in Central America, but the gangs in Brazil and elsewhere, they're very well developed because they have reached an entirely new point of understanding that they have political power and that they can negotiate with the government. So what do you see in the last three weeks happening in El Salvador? They had a truce in 2012, it fell apart. Homicides have skyrocketed again. And then one day, literally overnight, there were zero homicides in El Salvador. What a miracle, great law enforcement work, utter nonsense. The government went, sent their people to the prisons to negotiate with the, with the gang leadership over a specific electoral arrangement that would lead to the gang stopping to kill people and certain benefits accruing to the government. And if you talk to gang leaders, they are still, they're like kids in a candy shop. You know, they say, how does this work? Say, this is great. 
you know, we ask the government for something, and if they say no, we say we're going to dump bodies on the street, and then they give us whatever we want. This is great. You know, they, they're like kids. They, they love it. And, this, and, and the state, on the other hand, has become more refined, and they're beginning to say, okay, if we're going to do that, we can demand certain electoral benefits for ourselves out. It becomes more of a transaction and much more a more sophisticated negotiation. But the gangs now have a very clear idea of, where, of what they want to be, uh, where they're going, and how they want to get there. And if that progresses at the pace it's been prog progressing over the last three years, uh, not those futures that were initially listed up there will look uh, really good in comparison to what, what the region turns into and the knock-on consequences to our security going forward. And I'll leave it there. Matt Levitt, please. First of all, thanks for putting this conference together. This is fantastic. It's a pleasure to be up here, especially on this panel, with some really brilliant people. I think the reason, Doug, that we like states is because we think we understand them and we think we have expectations as to how they'll behave. And when it comes to these emerging networks and alignments, what changes is the nature of those relationships. Uh, and when they're really complicated, it's when they're not formal, <clears throat> but they're informal relationships. And that's what we're talking about. So you'll have some states in South America that are engaging in the types of activities you just described. And in other parts of the world, it'll be a completely different type of formal or even more increasingly informal network of a completely different nature. And what we tend to do is we tend to come up with pretty little boxes. And so we'll say, okay, well, this is, I'm not saying this is what you did, you're not, but this is how it's operating here, so this is how it's operating, and it's not. So Doug gave you one set of circumstances, and, and I'm going to give you another set, and there are probably, God knows, how many others. I just want to point out that this whole idea of dealing with emerging um, networks and alignments, we've never been good at it. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start historically, uh, and, and I was asked to speak based on my uh, research for my book on Hezbollah. We'll talk a little bit about some of the history of Hezbollah and its networks and alignments, and we'll, we'll, we'll come to the here and now. Um, but it's only more complicated now because of the way the world is flat. The ability to move money with the push of a button, the ability to move money through formal or informal networks, the ability to, you know, once upon a time, if you wanted to raise, launder, store, access, transfer funds, you had to get up out of your chair and you had to go somewhere and do it, and that's not at all the case now. Look, someone who knows what I'm talking about is smiling because he did it at OFAC himself or tried to stop others from doing it at OFAC. It's a whole different world today. Uh, and especially with communication, has completely changed the nature of things. I remember when I first started my career in Washington in the 1990s doing counterterrorism at the FBI, if you wanted to open up uh, an international terrorism investigation, a preliminary or a full field, you had to be able to demonstrate that the individual or the front company, whatever it was in question, was working with Group X. You would open up an IT Hamas, IT Hezbollah, IT Al-Qaeda, whatever it was, We'd have real problems if we had a hard time figuring out who an individual was affiliated with. And the people in this room, you won't be surprised that every once in a while you'd get a lead on someone and you'd open up a preliminary investigation. Sometimes you'd turn out that that was nothing and you'd close it. Sometimes it would turn out to be something and you'd pursue it. And it wasn't all that uncommon that your first lead information was that individual X was affiliated with Group Y. And as you pursue your preliminary, you turn out actually he was just hanging out with a guy from Group Y on the day when your source or your undercover stumbled across him. Actually, it has nothing to do with Group Y. He was working with a group in an entire different area, ideology, what have you, but is still uh, uh, worthy of a full field. And it would surprise us all the time. Hezbollah is a great example for this. All right? Uh, we're going to have people talk about this in more detail later, but for example, one of the biggest questions we deal with the policy world about Hezbollah in this area of illicit convergence is, is Hezbollah as an organization proactively, intentionally, top-down, raising funds, significant funds, through narco-terrorism? And the only reason there's a debate is because no one yet has the intercept where Hassan Nasrallah himself is saying, Ayman Juma, you know, send me the money. <laughs> That's not how it works. But it's what we expect. And as we, whether we are FBI or DEA or Treasury 
or West Point or whatever, is we're looking through all these different things in the classified and in the unclass both. This is the issue, the brick wall on this particular thing that we are, and, and, uh, find ourselves running into every single time. It's the question I'm asked every single time. On the stand, at conferences, Dr. Levitt, can you definitively point Nasrallah, to, and you can't. Now, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be able to point to some people right around him and maybe put some of this question to bed a little bit. But it begs the question, is, is, is that a fair question? Like, should we in the real world expect that there's going to be a memorandum of understanding and Nasrallah is gonna have signed? Not even assuming that we'll have, but is that how it actually works? Of course not. Hezbollah in particular has mastered acting not only in an overt manner, as a political entity, you like them, you don't like them, they are. They're a political powerhouse in Lebanon. They're a social welfare provider and a standing militia in Lebanon. But they also at the same time engage in covert activity and therefore they are better than just about anybody else in engaging in activities that they do with a reasonable deniability. And that's why this covert activity is so attractive to them. It's why it's so attractive to Iran both in terms of as a proxy of Iran and as Quds Force's own activities, and that shouldn't surprise. I just think it's important to take a step back and appreciate that what we're really trying to do here is not for the first time ever appreciate that there are these uh, illicit networks and that they are emerging. They've been emerging for a long time. They're non-static. They're changing all the time. It's that it, the pace, the scope, the scale, and the pace is so much faster. The problem is so much bigger. We don't have the luxury anymore of saying, listen, it's too complicated, or I just can't, and I don't, I don't have models, and how do you, we can't afford to do that anymore. Because this is changing the nature of the whole threat network that we face. And I don't like the word network, by the way, because that assumes, again, that it's a formal network. It is an informal network. I have a piece that came out today um, I, you know, I wish the Washington Post and Newsweek had, had not exposed the fact that the CIA apparently played a role in the assassination of Imad Mugnia, because I think that that's going to put Americans at risk. And I write that today. But if you want to know why the CIA was involved, I don't think it's because Mugnia was suddenly more involved than he had been in targeting coalition forces in Iraq, which is true. And I don't think it's because of the bombing of our embassy or the embassy annex, the marine barracks, and all these horrible things, TWA. All that's true and all that factored in. But I think it comes down to two words, Bill Buckley. And I get into great detail in this, and many of you know what I'm talking about already. But it's interesting, because at the time, I'm a little bit older than I look, trust me. At the time, for those of us who were dealing with trying to understand the hostage crisis, right, people had a terribly hard time understanding, is it Hezbollah or is it oppressed of the earth? Or is it Islamic Jihad organization? Or is it you know, any of the other t uh, terms that they were using, or Amal, or other groups? And in fact, it was only later that we really began to fully understand that it was a minority of the hostages who were actively targeted, like Bill Buckley, by Hezbollah's Islamic Jihad organization. The vast majority of people were kidnapped by clans that were part of Hezbollah, the Musawis, the Hamadis, and others, mostly because one of the Hamadis who had been involved with TWA 847 had been arrested in Germany and they wanted him freed. So they started kidnapping people. Some of the groups would do it and they would sell them off. It was, it was in the words of a declassified CIA memorandum, it was, quote, prowling for hostages. And the majority of these guys ended up with Hezbollah sold, but that it wasn't actually Hezbollah incorporated that was behind in the first instance many of the kidnappings. And there are all kinds of incredible stories. One prominent Westerner who gets kidnapped right after he meets with Nabi Berry, which makes Amal very angry at Hezbollah, and Amal tries to free a Hezbollah prisoner, so you have the two Shia organizations. People couldn't understand it for the life of them at the time, and the answer was because this was not a top-down, simple, organized plan. This was messy, and that was complicated for us. Not only was it complicated to understand, but we desperately wanted it to not be complicated because then it would be easier to figure out what to do. There's a lot less you can do if it's not Hassan Nasrallah himself or Hezbollah Incorporated that's doing things. When we were trying to understand in the first instance why a small number of Lebanese Hezbollah guys would partner with some Iraqi Badr guys and would try and assassinate the Emir of Kuwait, and would carry out seven bombings in a couple of hours in Kuwait. And 
why would they do this? For the, they, we couldn't figure it out. They were so invested in Lebanon that at the time, very focused on establishing a Shia Islamic state in Lebanon, a la the revolution in Iran. This was, you know, Lebanon and the Gulf states were the low-hanging fruit for the uh, exporting of the revolution. We didn't fully understand or appreciate at the time that while not then and not now can you say that every single foot soldier within Hezbollah is a adherent to Waliyat al-Faqih, the, the, the rule of the jurisprudent, that the leadership absolutely is. And if the supreme leader of Iran tells the leadership of Hezbollah or Badr or any of its other key proxies, look, this is what's going to have to happen, this is what will happen, which is what we saw happen again, not just back then, but in 2012. How many times have, not just me, I'm sure many in the room, been asked, what in the world is Hezbollah thinking, getting involved as it is in Syria, carrying out assassinations around the world at a time when you have the special tribunal for Lebanon going on in The Hague, Treasury was uh, outing um, Hezbollah activity in uh, uh, the Lebanese-Canadian bank action and other actions, used cars, narco, all kinds of, you know, not... uh, uh, you know, particularly religious behaviors, why in the world would they do this now? Um, in large part, it comes down to because it was in part in their interest and very much in part that the Iranians said so. And when the Iranians first sent someone from the Quds Force to Nasrallah, we now know, all open source, he said, I, I don't think this is such a great idea. Though the ability to do that Heisman to the Quds Force was significantly less than it once was because Mugnia was no longer. And then they sent someone from the office of the Supreme Leader and said, you know, you don't seem to understand. When we sent the guy from the Quds Force, what we meant is the Supreme Leader is asking you to do this. And that was the end of the story. Of course, it's a longer story than that, which is why I was so pleased when Mike asked me to write a whole article about it in PRISM, which you'll read during lunch. (laughs) Everybody remembers, especially now that it's back in the news with the murder, and I am very comfortable saying murder, of Alberto Nisman. I admit that it's not an academic issue for me. I knew Alberto uh, and uh, there's not a chance in hell he killed himself. But the Amia conspiracy is now very much back in the news. Most people are well aware of the details. I've got a whole chapter on it in, the, in my book on the, ne- the nature of the illicit networks, formal and informal both, that were going throughout South America, but in particular the tri-border area. But most people are unaware that those networks were not limited to the tri-border area or to South America. Among the things that have most surprised people from my book is the fact that at one point they had multiple types of call centers, the uh, Iranian and Hezbollah operatives, one of them running through the Iranian embassy, which they thought was secure, but the Argentinians had penetrated. Um, but at one point they were, they were literally um, kind of uh, swinging calls through a, a, uh, an apartment in Brooklyn. And so there were a couple of guys in Brooklyn, in New York, who were simply serving as a Hezbollah switchboard for people calling from South America. Then a few years later, when FBI New York started sending agents down to investigate AMIA, the 1992 bombing of the Israeli embassy a year and a half earlier, and other plots, there was a very disturbing situation where FBI agents get on a mill air flight down to uh, South America. This is not a public you know, flight. This is not in the news. No one's told anybody about this. They land. Uh, this is pre-cell phone. All their pagers go off. They call back to uh, FBI uh, New York uh, and are told by a very nervous-sounding colleague that pictures of them getting off their airplane just came across the fax machine in the FBI New York office. Now stop for a minute. That's, that's a little bit scary. But also, does it mean that Hezbollah necessarily had someone there? Or does it mean maybe that they had friends and networks and other people? The latter is, of course, much, much more likely. You mentioned, uh, Doug, you know, Venezuela. Uh, in my book, I write about uh, Razi Nassar al-Din, who was designated by the Treasury Department in June 2008 a uh, a Lebanese-Venezuelan dual citizen who at one point served as a Venezuelan diplomat uh, doing tours, I think, both in uh, Beirut and Damascus, uh, and according to the Treasury designation was knee-deep in Hezbollah fundraising, but also involved in uh, engaging in meetings about operations, unclear where those operations would be, uh, with people when he was visiting in Beirut. Most of us haven't thought about Razi Nasr al-Din in a while, except that suddenly, didn't get much coverage, but a week and a half ago, FBI Miami slapped up on, their, on its website, not a most wanted, but an information wanted, seeking information poster on Razi Nasser al-Din. 
And you I will leave it to your imaginations as to why Miami in particular might do that and might do that right now. One of the most interesting um, and shocking things that I found when I was investigating Hezbollah networks around the world in my book is that the networks, two networks historically in the 1990s through early 2000s, that were doing all kinds of illicit activities, fundraising, passport procurement, and operations uh, in Southeast Asia were almost all to a one Sunni. It's an amazing story. But this gets to networks. And it comes down in large part to personalities, as networks often do. The Iranian intelligence service, the MOIS, through its main regional station in Kuala Lumpur, got its hands on a radicalized Sunni named Pandu Yudhawunara. Pandu, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, criminal background, decided to become a, a more radical Islamist. It is not at all clear that he ever converted to Shiism. But he becomes an asset of MOIS. He goes to Iran for training, gets some training in Lebanon. And after a few years, he's recruited in the 1980s. He's handed over to Hezbollah. And he sets up the first of two really significant um, networks in the country, uh, and one in his case that came this close to blowing up the Israeli embassy in Bangkok in 1994, just weeks before Hezbollah successfully blew up the Amiya Jewish Community Center uh, in Buenos Aires across the world. We didn't know about the plot against the Israeli embassy, not us the Americans, not the Israelis, not the Thais, none of us knew about it, none of us thwarted it. The driver of the really sophisticated car bomb uh, got into a fender bender with one of those three-wheeled, you know, tut-tut taxis in, um, in, uh, in Bangkok. Uh, bad operational planning to plan this for 9 o'clock in the morning rush hour. <laughs> Uh, freaked out and ran the scene, and, and the story unwound from there. Fast forward more, rec more recently to 2012. We didn't know, apparently, for about a year that Hussein Atris, a dual Lebanese-Swedish citizen, was running a, an explosives, um, uh, basically explosives com uh, procurement network in, in Bangkok with a uh, facility he rented north of town. He was procuring chemical precursors and crystallizing them, which is the first main stage to make them into explosives, and shipping them around the world in bags marked kitty litter. Some of them we see from the uh, shipping documentation that was found in his warehouse were going around the world, including to places like South America. Uh, fast forward even more to just a few weeks ago, and the latest Hezbollah plot around the world was just thwarted in Peru. Um, we didn't know about his activities then, but it turns out that after uh, somebody, apparently the United States and Israel, assassinated Imad Mugnia, and then on top of that, as part of Iran's shadow war with the West, uh, Iran really wanted uh, Hezbollah to target Israeli tourists around the world to make it clear to the Israelis that there's a cost for messing around with their nuclear program. But Hezbollah didn't have the networks in place that it did once upon a time, post 9-11, they did not want to be caught in the crosshairs of what we used to call the war on terrorism. They withdrew not any of their financiers, logisticians, procurement officers, but a lot of their operatives who were there to make things go boom in the night very quickly, they did withdraw. And at one point, they did have in Manila a cache of, of explosives and weapons that they serviced every once in a while and oiled and made sure that they were still operative. But those types of people had been withdrawn, and so they put into operational uh, mode people who weren't trained as real operators. And I don't want to ruin Homeland or 24 for those of you who watch these shows, but in the real world, to do surveillance of someone actually does take some, some skill and training. So this person whose job was to collect chemical precursors and crystallize them and ship them around the world, and something he apparently was quite good at because we didn't know about it, um, was then told to go to places where tourists mingle and to conduct surveillance of Israelis and others, and he apparently was a little bit... Um, not sophisticated in his uh, OPSEC and was spotted pretty quickly. Uh, and then we found out about him and what he'd been doing for a year. And if you think that he was sitting there doing it on his own or that this was entirely by card-carrying members of Hezbollah, I've got another thing coming for you. Reminds me of a story of Magnus Ranstorp, a friend who's one of the longest time Hezbollah experts um, uh, working on these issues and now far beyond Hezbollah, he tells the story of going to interview a mid-level Hezbollah guy in Beirut. And uh, he, he sees the address, and it's a high-rise building, could be Citibank in Manhattan. And it's not that he expected it to be Tora Bora, but still, you don't expect it to be you know, Hezbollah incorporated in this big high-rise. And he goes up to this building, and the elevators open up into what looks like you know, a, ma a modern law firm. 
and there's a woman, her hair is covered, but she's, she's you know, uh, a very friendly, a receptionist, and she takes him into the equivalent of the green room. You know, this person you're meeting with isn't ready yet, but have a cup of coffee. A few minutes later, in walks a young man in a typically Lebanese, pointed leather shoes, tight jeans, tight black t-shirt, and, and dark glasses and the slicked hair, um, and a Yankees hat and says in perfectly American-accented English, I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting. And Magnus tells that his mouth, in, like in the cartoons, must have dropped to the floor because he wasn't expecting either the American-accented English or, I might add, as a fire-breathing, frothing-at-the-mouth Red Sox fan, the Yankees hat, which should have keyed him in immediately that this was an illicit actor of some type. Um, I did that line in front of an NYPD aud uh, audience once, and I'm here to tell the tale. Um, and the, the Hezbollah guy says, I don't know what you were expecting. I, I, I went to undergraduate uh, in Washington, D.C. I've traveled across most of the United States. I've got friends everywhere. What do you expect? We're going to have a membership card in our wallet? And my answer is yes. We're still looking for the membership cards in the wallets. And they don't exist. And not just the membership cards, but the bayat or the pledge. We don't think about things in terms of relationships, in terms of who you meet at this conference. More importantly than anything, any of us will say, no, nothing personal, than anything you'll hear is the opportunity at a conference like this to meet other people that are thinking about these things. And, and that is networking too in the purest sense. That's what our adversaries do time and time again. People were really shocked when Hezbollah carried out its one successful attack in the past few years in Burgas, Bulgaria. Bulgaria. What the hell in Bulgaria? Well, those of us who were paying attention knew that six months earlier, another Hezbollah plot had been foiled in Bar Bulgaria, but even that one shouldn't have surprised either. Because not only did we, the U.S., it's been reported publicly now and some of our allies, carry out an assessment of places where Iran's Quds Force or Lebanese Hezbollah might act in the world, places where they might have freedom of movement and the kind of networks in place, not formal but informal networks in place to facilitate their activities, and on that short list, was Bulgaria, we also shouldn't have been uh, surprised because if anybody was focusing on illicit movement of narcotics and human smuggling through Bulgaria, which is nothing new, they might have noticed the Bulgarian parliamentary report from several years earlier, which in this very long detailed report on human smuggling and drug smuggling, which is all about smuggling networks. They're not human smugglers, they're not drug smugglers, they're smugglers. And Tuesday they're moving this, and Wednesday they're moving that. We see this on our southern border too. They might have noticed, buried in there, a throwaway line about these guys working with Hezbollah. They don't say anything else, they don't explain how, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't have surprised. Um, the same with Cyprus, the plot that was thwarted a week and a half before the, the successful Bulgaria plot, again by dual nationals, dual Lebanese-Australian, Lebanese-French, Lebanese-Canadian operatives. Uh, there too, Cyprus comes up in the history of Hezbollah time and time and time again. And it's in part because of the ease of travel from Lebanon to Cyprus, the ease of movement there, but a whole host of other things that make Cyprus a very, very easy place to act. And so when Pandu, back in 1995 or six after the 1994 bombing of the Israeli embassy in Bangkok was thwarted, when he needs to get out of the country, they get him a fake, I think it was Nigerian passport, and where does he go? He goes to Cyprus. And we're surprised by these things time and time again, and we should not be. So, we expect that they're going to be our adversaries engaging in the best operational security, as you heard, when in fact they may not because one of the things they really want to do is to be able to leverage these networks. Sometimes they do it for other reasons because they're not always 10 feet tall. So the same individual who at one point was carrying out surveillance of Iranian dissidents in Los Angeles and later in London is promoted to be one of the two heads of the Quds Forces Unit 400, the unit that's created to uh, target Western diplomats from countries targeting Iran's nuclear program. And he goes, and he goes with the very same SIM card in the cell phone to Baku and Georgia and Thailand and India. Well, why don't you just put a little pretty ribbon on it for me? Sometimes they're not 10 feet tall. And other times, they are very cunning, and they leverage these networks. So, for example, of the approximately dozen plots, some by Hezbollah, some by the Quds Force, some by both that have been carried out or attempted in Baku, Azerbaijan, at least three of them were plotted, and one in particular that nearly, nearly targeted our uh, ambassador, by criminal elements uh, within Azerbaijan who had uh, ethnic ties uh, to Iran. 
So I'll just end by saying this. If you look at, if I, when I look at where we are now, if we want to stick just to the Shia side of the ledger for a moment, what is the most important element of convergence? The fact that Iran is today creating, let's change that, they have already created a Shia foreign legion. We are completely fixated, and with good reason, on the Shia foreign fighters. Some 20,000 foreign fighters from around the world, the largest number from Tunisia, which should get your attention because that's so far the only shining light of what's left of the Arab Spring, and about 5,000 from the West. That should get our attention. But there are at least as many Shia foreign fighters, and these guys are not going to simply hang up their coats and go back to being farmers and whatnot at the end of the day. This is something that Iran is going to have in its back pocket as a network to leverage for all kinds of things at the end of the day. And on the Sunni side of the ledger, I'm sure I wasn't the only one ripping my hair out after the Paris attacks when everybody was questioning, how can it possibly be that two brothers who claim allegiance to AQAP are working with one guy who's claiming allegiance to ISIS? It blows the mind. They're fighting each other in Syria and Iraq. How can it be? And if you look just a few years back in their history, these guys were BFFs. They were in the same network together in 2005, sending fighters to Iraq. They were involved in the same jailbreak operation. Yes, you like AQAP more and I like ISIS more, but what binds us is stronger than what separates us, and we know each other. Those relationships at the end of the day are so critically important. But because they're so difficult to identify and to quantify, we end up, as we often do in government when it comes to metrics, not using the best metrics, but rather the ones that are easiest to quantify, because we need numbers, here too, we end up, because it's so difficult to identify and to quantify and to explain these relationships and these networks, we end up dealing with what we know, which is primarily still states. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Dr. Tamara Makarenko. Nothing like being last on a panel before lunch and suffering from jet lag. So, let's see what we can do. Um, 15 minutes to talk about the nexus in Europe, 15 minutes to talk about the nexus in my mind is, um, is a death sentence. Um, Scott mentioned that um, he had spent two years of his life feeling, getting, getting comfortable with, with evidence of, of the convergence. Um, I was thinking about this, this talk um, yesterday evening on, on the flight and realized that the first time I wrote a paper on, on the relationship between organized crime and terrorism was in my second year undergraduate in 1993. I'd counted just now, um, and that was 22 years. Um, that, that's a rather long time, so not only am, now, am I jet-lagged, I'm now quite um, depressed. <laughs> um, so, I, I clearly am no longer 22 years old. Uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for um, being invited to, to this gathering today. Uh, and um, in part, it's because, uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with my very early work, it's because I... Um, developed a, a hobby, and that hobby was trying to identify or see where in the world there was a relationship between organized crime and terrorism, and how that relationship looked, how it worked. Um, nobody really cared about that pre-9-11, uh, to be honest. Uh, I remember speaking to my mentor um, and very good friend, the former, um, the late Professor Wilkinson, and um, Bless him, he looked at me after I wrote my first master's paper and he went, Tamada, this is all really interesting, but don't make a life of it. And about um, six years after that, he called me and apologized. Um, so, yeah, so the nexus has been weighing on my mind quite a bit over the years. Um, and, and that's good and bad because over the years, um, and especially since 9-11, I have uh, experienced um, ebbs and flows of interest in the convergence. Um, policy makers and those involved in, in identifying and countering the threat, quote unquote, um, are as um, vulnerable to fads um, as those of us, or not me, but those, those of us or those of you who um, 
decide to shop at, I, I don't know what the, the American equivalents are now, who decide to shop at um, American Eagle, is, that's a brand name, isn't it, versus um, Gap or, um, or somebody else. So although I very happily, and I think I grabbed the opportunity to speak here very quickly, didn't I, Michael? Um, I, I hung the phone up in my office and thought, oh, geez, where, where is this going to lead? Um, I'm hoping, and, and looking at the panel um, of speakers that, that um, have been organized for you today, that um, maybe things are slightly beginning to change. Um, and I'm not one to say something's too late because uh, nothing's ever too late given the state of the world. I, um, because I can speak about the Nexus for hours, I think the longest I went speaking about the Nexus to an audience was four hours. Um, so, so because I, I sort of have this habit of um, being able to, to drone on for, for a rather long time, I decided to be somewhat pedantic about my approach, and I actually wrote notes. Um, and this is um, something new to me, so uh, I, I shall try to remember to look at my notes, which are here, um, and, and keep this rather focused. Um, and focused essentially to looking at the trends that show whether or not there, in fact, is a convergence. And I, I will focus even more and just focus on Europe um, and a little bit on the periphery because it's Europe and Europe can't really be isolated. Um, as you're aware yourselves and as you've heard throughout the day and as you've read over the years, much of the debate surrounding any theory on convergence um, whether we call it a nexus or a continuum or a whatever we call it, um, has, has been centered primarily on examples from, from conflict and post-conflict states. We focus on the examples of, of South Asia, those coming out of Afghanistan and Pakistan. We focus on examples in, in South America, You're look, looking at Colombia, Peru, and Central America now. Um, we've looked at examples, and, and we often focus on examples in, in the Middle East um, and Africa. But seldomly over the years have we tried to identify and question whether or not this convergence exists in Western democratic states. And I asked myself, why? Why is that the case? And, and there are two, possibly two answers. One, um, and this is based on conversations I, I used to have with people in the, in the late 90s and early noughts, that... Um, a convergence simply wouldn't exist in our own backyard because, clearly, organized crime and terrorism make strange bedfellows. Clearly. Um, the second line of, of, of reasoning is that, um, well, give me an example. If you can't give me a solid example, Tamara, then it doesn't exist, so let's not discuss it. Fair point. So when you look at Western democracies and whether we take the US and, or Canada or, or Britain or the rest of the Europe, we kind of go, well, do we really need to discuss the nexus? Because the nexus actually exists out there where the big threat is. Um, well, in fact, uh, I'd like to show, um, it shouldn't come as a surprise, that um, a nexus or a convergence between organized crime and terrorism does exist in Europe. In fact, from... It exists from established historical foundations. It's not really that new, or at least we can point back to history and show that it's not really that new. Although the trends between, let's say, 19, the 1980s and early 2000s are rather different than those that are currently emerging, it is, in my opinion, after 22 years of considering this, and I feel rather comfortable by this, that um, organized crime and terrorism have never really been strange bedfellows, um, even if they have only ever existed in marriages of convenience. The history of the nexus in Europe um, is varied, and I've, I've tried to um, throw in a few, a few sort of highlights, dated highlights for you here, just because I wanted to provide this overview that actually the nexus has foundations in Europe. Um, it, 
the European history of the nexus follows a rather straightforward tra trajectory, I'd argue, and for the most part, it's been defined by alliances and to some degree appropriation of activities by one or the other. By the end of the 20th century, this included um, the addition of, of hybrid groups, quite possibly. Uh, for example, in the 1980s, as, as I've noted there, there was a functional relationship between the Sicilian Mafia, the Neapolitan Camorra, and, and various fascist terrorist groups. We know that. There is a relationship between the Camorra and the Italian Red Brigades, um, although the Red Brigades themselves were engaged in kidnappings and various bank robberies as a source of funding. Um, they also formed a strategic alliance with the Camorra, and we asked why. Well, they, they were used to, to help negotiate with the, with the authorities over kidnappings and, and how much ransom will be paid. Um, but the Camorra also assisted the Red Brigades in, in, target, in, in conducting targeted assassinations, in return for which the Camorra clearly gained financially. Um, in the 1990s, we also had sort of isolated examples, but still examples where you had the Italian Mafia um, itself realizing the benefits of actually adopting terror tactics. Um, the great anti-mafia drive of the 1990s was being quite successful and, and uh, the Italian Mafia wasn't necessarily very happy by that. So what did they do? Well, they used um, a series of car bombs near historic sites in Rome and Florence to intimidate the public, to try and get the public to, to change their opinion, to force and influence what the government was doing. Look at the late 90s and early 2000s and this convergence between organized crime and, and terrorism seemed largely relegated to the realm of, of Northern Ireland, especially in the European sense, um, both Republican and dissident groups. And by the end of that decade, you can speak to many in law enforcement in Northern Ireland, they would strongly argue that a lot of the offshoot groups, both dissident and Republican, were essentially hybrid entities. They were more focused and more concerned about engaging in criminal activities than they were to promote a political agenda. They knew that their political agenda wasn't really gonna get any place by the late 90s, early noughts. Um, and at the end of the day, you've created a life, you've created a, a social fabric, and that social fabric became embedded in criminality. In fact, the same could be said for Greece's 17th of November, who, having significantly turned away from the use of violence, um, they used their organization to cultivate their engagement in organized crime. Uh, this included everything from fraud to various types of smuggling. Um, I conducted some, some interesting field research in Greece in the, in the late 1990s, and it became very obvious that November 17th, or what was remaining of it, was predominantly criminal in, in its function. Um, there was very little that would have defined it as terrorism even then, uh, suggesting that, quite frankly, it may have um, gone through at least some process of transformation. It's clear that the early convergence in Europe pre-2000 predominantly concerned what we used to call ethno-nationalist left or right wing terrorist groups, um, that commonly operated in the European theater. At such, discussing the trends of alliance formations and, um, and uh, the appropriation of the tactic of the other wasn't really far-fetched. Um, and you can argue it down, you can boil it down to the fact that it was, in many cases, an operational necessity that was facilitated between groups. Neither group, um, really, whether it was criminal or, or terrorist, we know wanted to fundamentally alter the fabric of society in which they operated. They wanted to possibly change um, the political ideology, but not fundamentally alter the way society was organized. What the pre-2000 period in Europe didn't account for, and what we know now and what's easy to, to discuss retrospectively, is the growth of militant Islamist groups and it, and more importantly, independent militant cells throughout the European states. Um, this, as, as you all, all, all know, has created a, a very unique um, context in which, for me even, um, there were some initially unexpected ties between organized crime and terrorism, which subsequently developed through the European theater through the 2000s. So if we look at Europe, sort of that, that take that historical trajectory of, of this 
uh, of this um, uh, sort of admittance that there was a convergence of sort between organized crime and terrorism, um, we, we sort of end the 2000s or look into to, to, to the 2000s and go, what is the threat tra trajectory generally in Europe? Um, if we look at the European threat environment as, is, as it has existed over, let's say, the past three years, what realities are there? There are several, um, and, and, and clearly we don't have time to go through them, but through them all at least, but I've, I've sort of highlighted four, and I've highlighted four because these four sort of uh, form the, um, the foundation for what I've identified or what I think are the emerging trends um, in terms of, of the nexus in Europe. The ones, the trends that maybe we might not call trends yet because we don't have that data set, um, but there are very interesting developments that if they continue would be very interesting. This first um, reality, uh, excuse the, the use of the word because I, I don't think realities really exist, but um, this first reality is that militant Islamist cells throughout Europe continue to seek to establish or maintain operational connections to a larger network. It's transnational. I think, I think Matt, you, Matt mentioned um, this transnational context in which um, terrorism exists. These connections are driven by a, such a desire to be part of this larger, um, again, I'm going to use the word global jihad, which I don't like either, but for lack of better words at the at this point. They're driven by this desire to be part of this global jihad, that involvement in providing support becomes as important as actual participation in violence. And for the European context, this is very important because now we are talking about individuals who more than happily will provide logistical and financial support to the operations of, of terrorism. Um, and, and that, in this context, as we'll see a bit later on, feeds into um, this nexus of, of them engaging in criminality directly. This is exacerbated by new conflict zones, uh, small sea conflict zones, that provide new training ground for recruits. And every year we have a new conflict zone with new training grounds, whether we're talking about northern Mali and the, and the rest of the Sahel, or whether we're talking about Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, you name it, something new is popping up, and that becomes this new training ground. Um, and with these new training grounds, we're, we're seeing this associated commitment of European recruits to identify ways to become part of that. Physically, that's to get themselves across the border so that can, they can be part of that, of that struggle. Within the European context, this is very important because it highlights the vulnerability of Europe's weakest borders. And the staunchest allies and the staunchest promoters of the European Union don't like this because when you talk about the weakest European borders, you talk about places like Spain, you talk about places like Greece, you talk about the borders of Central Europe the Balkans going into the rest. Greece becoming another, another, um, another route from, from Turkey. It's not just Turkey. You need to get from Turkey into Europe. <laughs> we like to blame Turkey a lot right now for things going on. Going on. Um, third are immigration patterns. Immigration patterns are creating links between diaspora communities within Europe and their home nations. Uh, this is obvious, this is not new. But it is kind of new because these links are now being used to facilitate introductions of new illicit networks and operations. So if we take the examples of, of um, sort of 2000 to 2012 of what was happening in Sahel and how those relationships sort of uh, quite naturally extended to diaspora communities within Europe. Um, South Asia, we look at Pakistani networks, this, is, this exists as, as well as smaller Af Afghan networks, for example. Um, these diaspora communities are, are creating new networks and new nodes to cross and extend into the European market. 
Uh, and that's important, we'll and I will endeavor to explain why in the next slide. And finally, there's this very interesting emerging trend of a generational crossover between European-based criminal and terrorist operatives. More specifically, what we've been seeing are third-generation youths, those youths, I tell you, um, are justifying their simultaneous involvement in militant Islamist ideology and criminal activities. Um, this is something I'll talk about a bit more if I have time, but this is, I think, one of the most interesting developments, at least in the European theatre. So what are these current trends? What are these emerging trends that, that um, we think are, are observable, identifiable within the European theatre? Let's start with alliances. As I've noted pre be before and, and, and time and time again, the most basic of ties between organized crime and terrorism is that of a, of a marriage of convenience that comes through an alliance. Alliances, as, as we know and as we've experienced, are, are often ad hoc in nature. They're not necessarily ones that, that exist for, for, for decades. Um, three minutes, thank you. I try. <laughs> Um, let's go through this very quickly then. Okay, so three, three trends in terms, of, in terms of alliances. There are growing ties between militant cells in Europe and crime groups, with the former specifically interested in gaining access to smuggling routes. Concerns for us were initially flagged in the late 2000s when Sicilian criminal groups were involved in trafficking migrants from conflict areas in Africa to Europe. Very interesting. Um, but the same appears to be happening now with Turkish groups, for example, facilitating the return of European, indigenous European ISIS militants home, back home. Um, case in 2012, interestingly, saw an Italian-based militant cell engage Balkan criminal links um, to transport arms via an Italian port. Um, that Italian port just happened to be a very well-known cocaine transshipment hub. Um, and we're also seeing indications and, and evidence with a small e that um, the IRA has been laundering money on behalf of the Drangheta since 2012. And this is, you know, very interesting. The second trend in terms of alliances is that, is that there appears to be a decreased resistance between criminal and radical Islamists to cooperate. Some would argue, and, and I see this argument because we've seen a lot of cases in the European field, that, that this is a bit of a, a prison recruitment legacy. And I know about three, four, five years ago, we used to have conferences on, on prison recruitment and the role that played in, in, um, in contributing to the spread of, of radical um, or militant Islamist beliefs, really. This is still the case. Look at cases um, coming out of France, like that of Mohamed Mera, for example. You look at the Garcilawi network, for example, and that very much is the case. And that becomes very interesting. Um, even more so, uh, and I don't know, this was a bit less pub publicized, uh, in fact, I'm not sure if it was publicized, but um, there was a, a Swiss-based militant cell uh, affiliated to a king that actually organized a group of petty criminals who were engaged in, in essentially thievery. They stole mobile phones and computers on a daily network to the tune of approximately 5,000 euros a day. That's quite impressive if you start adding that up. Um, and that was nothing necessarily new that the Swiss were seeing, um, let alone what they were seeing in Germany and Austria and other places that don't necessarily like to talk about it quite as much as the Swiss. But there's also this generational acceptance that I mentioned before. There's the third trend in terms of alliances that, that we've seen is that there are spor sporadic cases that these third generation Islamists are using their family connections to access the criminal sphere. Let me explain this. The Balkans, perfect example, where you have third generation youth who have re-established their re relationship with, with Islam. Unfortunately, some of them have established a relationship with a more radical militant variety. In their same family or their same community, they still have one generation removed access to still very thriving criminal networks, smuggling networks. 
And this falls into that trust game, that community, that game that, well, why wouldn't we cooperate? We know one another. I trust you. You're my cousin. You're my father. Um, you're my brother. Interestingly, because the militant side of that equation has other interests, what we've seen in the Balkans, for example, again, is that access to the criminal element has been opened up to militants outside of the community. So, for example, you find a bunch of British, Pakistani radicals in the middle of the Balkans engaged in drug smuggling, let alone human smuggling. Um, again, very interesting. Our concern in Europe, Balkans isn't very far. It's not too difficult to get um, to get from the heart of, of Kosovo or, or the border areas of Macedonia um, into, into Europe proper without having to show anybody documentation. Um, so, so yes, that is a, a wee concern. I'm going to move very quickly to the last slide. One, one minute? Thank you. I lie. <laughs> um, appropriation and in, in, integration. Three key trends. I'm going to whiz through this. The first is that there is a continuation of ethno-nationalist groups themselves being involved in criminal activity. Um, I use the word ethno-nationalist loosely. Essentially, we're referring to, to the IRA, uh, the Republican and, and dissident offshoots, if you look at the paramilitaries or, or the IRA itself, um, where, again, uh, colleagues in Ireland essentially call them full-time criminals and part-time terrorists. So there we go. The second trend, militant Islamist cells are continuing to secure direct involvement in criminal activities as a source of funding and logistical support. We know this, this is nothing new. But what's new is that these, this third generation, this new generation of militant Islamists are justifying their direct engagement in criminality, in criminality not because, not, or not only because they have potentially a family affiliation on the criminal side, but because these new hotspots, the Syrias of the world, the Sahels of the world, you have these new militants, these, these, the newer generation of militants, who, quite frankly, themselves were tied and embedded and have links, fundamental and sort of natural links to criminal sphere. If you, if, if you look at Akim, for example, and their, and their, and their relationship to, um, to, to smuggling through the Sahel, it's not new. And it's nothing that they would have broken away. Again, it became a relationship thing. Um, and, it was in, and it was used very much. Let me sum up. I've just put this, I'm not going to discuss this map. This is a bit dated. I, 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 I should say I did this in 2013. I got one of my minions to do it in 2013. Um, I'm in the private sector, so I'm allowed to call them minions because I pay them. Um, so so um, it's a bit dated, but I thought it actually, um, for those of you who can, who can read all of that, it, it gave sort of an interesting summary of, of what's going on. And if you actually look, try to superimpose that um, on the little section of Europe of the, of, of the map that, um, that Scott put up on, on his network nodes. Um, a lot of interesting uh, commonalities, I think, would, would come up. The European theatre naturally presents different variations of the nexus that don't necessarily follow the same trends as they do in our sort of favoured post-conflict and conflict um, societies in, in those zones that, that we understand a bit better. Um, because they're characterized by political instability and, and periods of sustained conflict and embedded insurgent and criminal activity and whatnot, we, we get that. The relative political stability and social cohesion evident in most Euro European states means that the environment in Europe in which a convergence between organized crime and terrorism develops is actually more complex. But it is an environment that has not hindered the development of this relationship ad hoc alliances, the appropriation of criminal activities are likely to continue. There is nothing to indicate otherwise. Equally important for the de development of the convergence in Europe is what happens in the neighboring lands. For example, um, you know, we used to talk about indications that French and British recruits were being trained in North Africa. 
Um, this being a big concern because they're going to come home and what are they going to do when they come home? My so what and, and my biggest interest in that formula is that whilst these recruits were in North Africa, they witnessed the commonality with which the Sahel-based militants engaged in organized crime activities. A similar predicament is happening in Syria, where there too is a confluence between militant Islamist operations and engagement in organized crime. So what we're seeing today, and what I think is actually one of the more disturbing trends in terms of how the nexus, how this relationship or convergence between organized crime and terrorism will develop as we go into the future, is that the more pure operational theaters, the more the pure battlegrounds of the past, um, the Afghanistans and, and early Iraq, for example, um, in which the militants themselves distance themselves from the banal world of, of organized crime, those theaters appear to have fizzled out. And they have been replaced by a new reality in which organized crime as an activity and as a relationship to is an inherent part of the militant arsenal. And once we understand that it is an inherent part of the militant arsenal that is there to be used, to be leveraged, in order to increase their chances of success, um, then I think we need to go back to the very beginning and go, why are we here again today um, discussing the convergence between organized crime and terrorism as we have on and off again since 2001? Um, and maybe this is the time when you go, well, because there clearly is a problem and we don't want that confluence to continue going forward. Thank you for your patience and Thank your Thank you all. Thank you all. Your Thank timing. all the panelists. Um, we're going to just have a couple of questions. And what I'd like to do is just ask three, have three questions at Syriatum and then let the panelists uh, respond before we break for lunch. But let me just uh, note that the fact, Dr. Makarenko, that you were in your second year in college in 1991 may be depressing to you. It's really depressing to me. <laughs> um, OK, uh, questions, please. Front row right here. Young lady in the front row, please. Hi, um, I'm Samira Daniels. I, um, I, I don't know that much about Europe, but I have spent a, a lot of time uh, looking at you know, the drug situation in the United States, trafficking and so forth. And in that sense, um, you know, I see some parallels. And I'm wondering, um, maybe I just don't understand your uh, definition of terrorism as such, because, you know, the question does come up, and so what? Because, you know, these patterns, I mean, uh, these illicit activities have been part of uh, immigration throughout the centuries. <laughs> I mean, this is how when immigrants go to other countries, they can't get jobs, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So I'm just wondering if you could just clarify yeah. this and, and also, you know, speak to the point that while this is being identified as a, you know, conversion, <laughs> recent conversions, it, it's, it's a very, you know, the, 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 there are intermittent patterns of this throughout, I don't know, let's say 100 years at least, but longer, particularly in the heroin, in the heroin market. Thank you for that question. We have another question right here in the second row. Hi, Michelle Hughes. Um, my question is for Mr. Farah. When Michael and I were working on our book, Impunity, one of the things that we were really trying to look at in our case studies from conflict on dealing with illicit power was um, what were the tools that were tried or the things that were tried in order to create checks on the acquisition of political and economic power by these power structures and what worked and what didn't. Since you've studied Central America in particular so deeply, I'm really interested in your thoughts on what you're seeing right now in El Salvador and Honduras. What is the check? What's keeping, what's keeping these organizations from taking complete full autonomy of those areas that they want to control? Um, because we've had people in the course of doing our book who have argued that civil society is key, that women in community security is a key factor, that law enforcement is critical. What are you seeing? Thank you. And let's take uh, this gentleman right here in the fourth row. 
Yeah, hi. I thought I would uh, throw out a very you simple are, question. Sir, you are. Uh, my name is Andy Stewart, formerly a DIA, now private sector, so I can ask Maverick questions now. You know, there's a, there's a saying that, you know, supply will always meet demand. So you all laid out a very comprehensive case for all these networks, and it almost sounds like the developing world jealous of these new capitalists out there. Um, do you think that we're just fighting the natural trends of capitalism, globalization in a new competitive uh, world? Thank you. Um, who would like to take the first stab at any of those three questions? I'll, 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 if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take a stab. I'll take a stab. Um, the so what? The so what on, on at least on, on the development and evolution of, of terrorism, that side of things, is that, quite frankly, as, uh, as a citizen of, of the UK, I don't want a militant who's been experienced in Syria to come up through the borders um, and decide to to conduct an attack. That's one so what. But yes, smuggling networks are one thing, and we deal with migration patterns and and both smuggling and trafficking and all of all of that all of that conundrum. And, and that's a separate issue. Um, but it's the point not one percent of the militants that are coming back through that are using and leveraging those networks that become interesting. The other so what is one of financing. Uh, when terrorism was no longer state sponsored or is no longer primarily state sponsored, um, you know, when it was state sponsored, the state drives your agenda because actually the amount of money that a state used to give a terrorist group would, would dictate what they did. Access to free financial flows um, is actually quite attractive because nobody's dictating your strategy apart for yourself. Um, that allows you to recruit, that allows you to engage in social media, that allows you to buy computers, that allows you to be part of, of the networked world, that allows you to bank money in a real bank, <laughs> that allows you to open and buy and invest in. Um, you know, I work with investment banks on a, on a daily basis that allows you to invest in commodities, invest in infrastructure, and because you've invested in with the Asia Development Bank or Merrill Lynch or Bank of America, it's legitimate money. Um, and then who else is in your network? So that's the so what. The so what is not that this happens every day and that we're going to see the threat, it's the threat multiply over and over again. The so what is, well, what, so what about 7-7? So what about 9-11? They're one-offs. Are they one-offs? I mean, we wouldn't be sitting here if we had the attitude, th that sort of attitude of, well, what if they all converge into a pinnacle again and we get an another 9-11 or another 7-7? Uh, and quite frankly, they were two, two over a large period of time. So why are we throwing all of this time and effort um, and energy into it. That's the so what. So the so what is the one life. Um, the so what is our standard of, 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 of living, our, our, our understanding of, of what is fair and equal and, and all of that. So it becomes one of our own ideology. It's the idea that um, Dr. Gorka discussed this, this morning. Do we have an idea to counter their ideas? Um, and I think sometimes we don't, so we need to be very clear what our idea is and what we're doing. Um, so that, that's the so what. The supply, supply demand question is very interesting. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it, even though I'm in the private sector and um, I live off of supply demand. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it because apart for the criminal supply and demand and, and that, that acquisition, that, the, the necessity to, to want to be as rich as, as uh, the X number of mil legitimate, small L, legitimate millionaires or billionaires in the world, um, yeah, that's a criminal dynamic. That's when you're sitting back in the middle of, of wherever and you build your White House and you have um, your sauna and, you know, 20 cars because they, they cost money in that status. Uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, mirror over to, to the militant Islamist cell who is who's just worried about actually um, the expense sheet and, and, and what it costs to, to travel across the border into Syria or to buy um, rather basic equipment, which doesn't cost that much. Um, but it, it means that if you want to do it on the sly, you're going to engage in a bit of credit card fraud because the bank's not going to flag it up because it's too little. You're going to engage in mortgage fraud because the, flag, the bank's not going to flag it up because 5,000 pounds is too little. Um, so uh, that's 
th th that's my stab at the so what. Thank you. Matt? I'll just uh, add on the supply and demand side that there is, there is something to that, but it's, I find it more with illicit actors, it's opportunity and opportunity cost. So I was actually going to highlight a credit card fraud example. Make a long story short, a Hezbollah network engaged in uh, uh, dual use item procurement in Canada uh, is uh, making more money than it knows what to do with through basic credit card fraud and is connected to a cell in North Carolina because one of the individuals is providing all these fake IDs. At one point, Hezbollah guys in Lebanon say, hey, would you like some of our uh, fake super notes? Would you like some of our counterfeit $100 bills? Would not be great, right? Because then it would be free and we'd be undermining their economies. At one point, they have this fantastic conversation. The, the summary of the Canadian tech cut, the, the telephone intercept, I, is actually available publicly. I can, I can give it to you. Where they talk about um, engaging in life insurance fraud. Can you in Canada take out a life insurance for my boy in South Lebanon who's go, going to, quote, go for a walk and never come back? Suicide bombing with yourself in Canada as the beneficiary. The guy on the phone in Canada says, well, literally says, I don't know if they'd pay out for that. And he says, don't worry, I'll get your death certificate. This is something other than suicide bombing. And then they say, no, no, we don't need to do it. Why? Why get more risky? The, the, the odds of getting caught in credit card fraud are minuscule. If you are caught, the punishment is not very significant. We're doing this with great success. So it's opportunity cost. It's what they know. So constricting the operating environment, which is really what counterterrorism is all about, is critically important. And while there'll be conversations on finance later today, that's why I like to remind people all the time that on the AML CFT, you know, both sides of that ledger, CFT is maybe counterterror finance a little sexier uh, and very effective, but AML is, is no four-letter word. AML is extremely important to the extent you can put regulations in place to deny Alyssa actors easy accessibility and opportunity in the financial system, you can push them in other directions. Thank you. Matt. Doug, you had a direct question. On the, on the question to me, this, the short answer is essentially nothing. <laughs> nothing works. Uh, what, what keeps them from taking over? I would argue that in many cases they actually have taken over, that the, the tipping point has been passed. And uh, I've argued this in some of my writing, which isn't particularly popular in some circles because it's, it's viewed as too pessimistic. I, I'm being a little facetious, but I think in reality, yes, that there, you have to have the political one. People always saying, oh, what are we going to do in Central America? We need to do something like Colombia. The fundamental difference in Colombia, there are many differences, but the fundamental difference to me in Colombia was that society as a whole and the government said, okay, enough, we're going to turn this around, and they began a different dynamic. They're nowhere near that in Central America. Uh, right now, if you look at the one network that's moving all that money in, in El Salvador, the 800 and some odd million dollars, the people whose businesses are being appropriated and taken over by this massive uh, flow of unexplained money, instead of fighting back, they're essentially waiting for an offer on their own business. Well, when, how, are they gonna, how much are they going to give me? You know, then, I can, then I can just cash out and retire. Um, so the civil society, the political opposition, all of those things are not working there for multiple reasons. Uh, I think that if you, there are cases, small community cases, uh, some a little bit larger, where direct interventions in, uh, in pre-gang activity and, and where you are able to create environments, particularly the, the uh, domestic violence environments are changed, where you can essentially remove people from the environment in which they're in and give them a modicum of uh, difference, things change radically. And I think that what, you know, what the great lesson to me, one of the lessons of watching Columbia closely, was that the downward cycle was really fast and really awful, and the upward cycle was almost as fast as almost, and almost as good. I mean, it, you can, a little bit of engagement and a little bit of political will uh, really goes a long way because people over time, these organizations and the architecture that they build to protect themselves, once it starts crumbling, it can, it can crumble. And I think you're seeing a bit of that in, in Venezuela now where they, you know, they've, they have this house of cards that's, uh, that's really shaking. And I think you know, Chavez was pretty good at knowing where to put the bucket to catch the leak from the water and where to shore up the wall. Maduro's just sort of knocking the whole house down. <laughs> he doesn't have it. He's not, he's not particularly interested in or able to do much else. So I think that, I think that the, you have to come up with, with the political will sector uh, factor before almost anything else matters, in my opinion, which is why the idea of giving another billion dollars to Central America and hoping that doing the same things we're doing with a billion dollars more is going to make a difference, I find 
not a particularly brilliant strategy. I think it's the easy thing to do because it's what we know how to do. But by every metric, everything we've measured in Central America in the last five years as we've done uh, CARSI and other things and put in close to a billion dollars, every metric is far worse than it was when we started. So another billion is not likely to reverse that trend. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Dr. Helfstein, one, one network to embrace them all. <laughs> so I, I will just very briefly comment on the, uh, on the supply and demand question. And that is to say uh, we have had um, – a conversation about convergence and smuggling and governance um, and, and crime that has been almost void of economics. And I think we do that to our detriment. And that supply and demand is really a critical factor in a lot of this. And quite frankly, if you go back to world economic history or even U.S. capitalist history, there's a lot of gray zone in there. And, uh, and I think it's really important to remember that context. Uh, and we are very slowly as, as a government, and we see it with things like ISIS, trying to bring some of the finance and the economics back into the equation. But, you know, Matt heroically worked in government trying to do this. We're still, 15 years later, I think at the early stages. We're still not treating it as a strategic cornerstone, but we treat it as a tactical mechanism. And so if we're going to think about how these things are really converging in the world, I, I believe the economics of it are, are really critically important. Can I just underscore that with one quick example? Think about ISIS moving oil and basically laundering it, mixing it with other oils into southern Turkey. That is, a ver that is an absolutely clear supply and demand. The, the government of Turkey has not been providing uh, full services in that part of the country for many years. Ever since the oil for food program, they've been able to get uh, black market, gray market oil deeply discounted. If those um, uh, illicit oil flows were to be shut off immediately today as part of our counter ISIL campaign, Turkey would suddenly, the next morning, have a huge problem on its hands in terms of the economy in the south. So absolutely, gray market very much part of that official economy in the South and a very concrete example of how it ends up affecting our ability to counter terror finance in the immediate. Thank you all. Uh, and thank you all. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just, uh, for my personal pleasure, I'd like, after hearing these two panels, sh quick show of hands. How many of you feel that what we've discussed for the last two panels does represent an existential threat to the United States? Good. All right. Um, thank you very much. We're going to break for lunch, and uh, it'll be an hour. Uh, we'll, we'll reconvene at uh, 1330. Thank, help join me in thanking them.